Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, July 18th. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council. Uh, we have uh, a lot going on today at the council, a lot of policy discussion that will be taking place over the next number of hours. Uh, but we are going to start our day with a proclamation commemorating Peace Day in honor of Maddie J.T. Stepanek's life and legacy. And that proclamation will be led by council members Katz, Albernaz, and Ludke. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. If we've ever needed Peace Day in Montgomery County, today is the day for it. Um, I'm, I did want to, my, beyond my colleagues who are here, we have uh, Jen Lynn, who, who is very well known in Montgomery County. And, and this young lady is Leanne Smith. Now, now I've been told that it's, you say it, Leanne, right? Because she has the distinct. <laughs> She has the distinction of being Jimmy Carter's niece, and we're going to hear from her, and she's going to explain the, the peace symbol in a, in a moment. But, um, and we're going to hear from my colleagues as well, and then we have a proclamation. We have, we are, a mosaic of gifts to nurture, to offer, to accept. This quote was written by Maddie J.T. Stepanek, a young man that gave so much to our community and our world in such a short amount of time. Matthew Joseph Thaddeus, known as Matty J.T. Stepanek, was born July 17, 1990, and began writing poetry at the age of three, which he referred to as heart songs. Matty was an accomplished American poet and published seven best-selling books of poetry and peace essays. Before his tragic death at the age of 13, Maddie had become nationally known as a peace advocate and motivational speaker, all while suffering from a rare disorder longer than I can pronounce. In 2011, Oprah Winfrey names uh, Maddie as one of her all-time this is Oprah Winfrey saying this, as one of her all-time most memorable guests in the 25-year history of her show. In fact, Maddie convinced Oprah not to retire from the show on its 20th anniversary through an email saying, and I'm quoting, it's good for the world and good for Oprah not to retire. His hero was former Jimmy, uh, President Jimmy Carter, who described Maddie is the most extraordinary person whom I have ever known. To honor Maddie, there is a Maddie J.T. Stepanek Park, which is a 26-acre park located within King Farm in Rockville. The park was dedicated in October 2008 at the park. Uh, you will see a life-size bronze statue of Maddie and his service dog, Micaiah. This past Saturday, we, many of us, had the honor of attending Maddie J.T. Stepanek Peace Day of Gathering at the park. It was extremely moving, to say the least, and powerful events celebrating Maddie's birthday and peace legacy. Shortly after Maddie's death, citizens in his King Farm neighborhood established the volunteer-based, not-for-profit, Maddie J. Stepanek Foundation with the mission of making Maddie's message accessible to everyone. To learn more about Maddie and the Maddie J.T. Stepanek Foundation, please go to www.maddieonline.com. And now we're going to hear from uh, Councilmember Albernaz, Councilmember uh, Lutke, and then we're going to hear from Leanne, and then uh, Jen, uh, 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 Jenny Stepanek as well. With that, Councilmember. Thanks so much, Councilmember Katz. So Peace Day and this event is one of my favorite events every year in Montgomery County. It's an extraordinary opportunity for us to come together 
And from 1999 to 2003, I had the distinct honor and privilege of working at Children's National Medical Center. And I actually met Maddie and Jenny at that time. Um, Maddie was a celebrity at the hospital, uh, loved by everyone, the staff, the volunteers, and you could immediately sense a presence from Maddie, a wisdom that went well beyond his years. And you felt truly at peace in that presence. And that peace has never been more important than right now. Our country feels like it's on fire. And the forces trying to divide us will not succeed because of people like Maddie, because of communities like Montgomery County, because of leaders like Jenny Stepanek, who have made sure that Maddie's legacy will never be forgotten. On a lighter note, I recently bought a bumper sticker that said, less honkin', more tonkin'. <laughs> we need to make sure that here in Montgomery County, we be a that we are and, and will continue to be a model of civility, a model of trying to work together even when we have very distinct and passionate differences so that we can all live in harmony. And so thank you, Councilmember Katz, for putting this very important proclamation together, and I'm honored to be a part of it. I did not have the opportunity to meet Maddie while he was with us, um, but I was an avid listener of the Jack Diamond Morning Show, and I would get extra excited whenever Maddie would be on the show because as soon as you would hear his voice and as soon as you would hear the profound things that would come out of this small child's mouth, you couldn't help but believe that you were listening to an angel who was placed here on earth. Um, and it would fill you up. Um, and one of the things I love the most about Maddie's heart songs is not just the significance of the message, but that they did in fact, and remember this was a child writing this, recognize the humanity in all of us, recognize that humans are not perfect, but give you a roadmap for moving forward in a positive fashion. Um, that is his legacy, and it is a beautiful one. And from time to time, we, all are humans, we all need to go back and revisit that and hit pause and take that moment when you feel upset, hurt, wronged, and go back to that to find a center, to find a grounding again. Um, I urge you all to visit the park over at King Farm. It's a beautiful place and space, and it is newly bedazzled. Um, again, after this weekend's uh, Peace Day event with little hearts and, and rocks that have, have been strewn all about, go find some, go take some time to reflect. And I wanna thank Jenny for her tireless work in making sure that peace is a part of our everyday life and in persistently giving of herself back to our community. You are a treasure, so thank you. Hi, I'm Leanne Smith from Plains, Georgia, and I do stretch my words out a little bit. Um, <laughs> or so I've been told since I got up here uh, in this uh, neck of the woods. But, um, I didn't get to know Maddie either, but over the years that Jenny lived in America, Georgia, which was only about 10 minutes from me, I saw this wonderful lady full of spirit and peace signs, no less, which I love, um, whizzing around the streets, coming to every event that was possible, always with a smile on her face and an uplifting word for anybody that was there to listen. Uh, she later asked me to be on the foundation the Maddie Foundation, and I was very honored to do that. Uh, Jimmy Carter is my uncle, Rosalind, and my dad, and her name is Rosalind. She's named after um, somebody in our family named Rosa. Um, is my aunt, so by marriage, I'm related to Jimmy Carter as a niece. Well, when they put him in hospice, or he came home that Saturday, I just had this kind of meltdown moment of who was going to do all the things that he did to carry on peace throughout the world because you know I'm kind of partial and I'm thinking you know this is my uncle and he's wonderful and I love him to death and he does all this good but what happened 
from this point on. So later that afternoon, I called Jenny in my meltdown stage, and I'm like, Jenny, well, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, this is, I'm seeing this is more than I can bear at the moment. And she just said over the phone that it's our place to take, to fill in his shoes and to carry on peace and love and empathy and compassion for all the people that are around us because we all are equals. And that's what my uncle truly believed. And that's what Maddie believed. And I think that that's how they came together. And I think that that's now our job is to carry on their legacy and to share peace however we can possibly do it, whether it be speak to somebody at the grocery store or hang a peace sign on the front door. I hung 18 of these that week and it went snowball through the news and now I've done over 300. And they're hanging and it just says, you know, spreading peace with Uncle Jimmy on the back. So it doesn't matter, big or small. It's, it can be a smile. But we just need y'all working with us to help spread Maddie Stepanik and Jimmy Carter's message of peace because it is possible. It's very much so possible. And I appreciate being invited, and I've enjoyed my trip here, and I will be back <laughs> now that I know how to get here. And, and as they say, come back off and you're here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Leanne. Um, and she's right. Peace is for all generations. Like you've got this, I think when Maddie and Jimmy were good friends, he was in his 80s and Maddie was like maybe 10 years old when they finally met and they became best friends. I, I, I want to say, first of all, thank you, council member. I want to say, Sydney, council member Katz, I'm being official here, um, and the county council um, and the entire county in Montgomery County, Maryland, for choosing year after year, year after year, to say peace matters. Peace does matter, and it's easy to remember peace when we go to the Peace Day. All right, we have the Peace Day, and, and Maddie's Foundation provides you, at no cost, this opportunity to come together and get to know your neighbors, get to know your elected leaders, people who want to be leaders, people who are the children that are sometimes annoying you and like running through your garden, but get to know your neighbors, get to know how we are the same and that we have some similar needs. Get to know what the needs are so we can tend to basic needs and be okay and play together, talk together, be together. So we offer this event and hundreds of people come and they do arts and crafts and listen to music and then we go on to the next day. And that's what matters is the next day. What matters is after Jimmy Carter, after Maddie Stepanek, after we finish proclaiming peace right now and you all have a heavy agenda today that could devolve into something that's not kind. I want everybody to remember that peace is possible. Peace is not perfection. Peace is not a destination. It is a journey. It is purpose. We can always in fact not we can we will always have conflict we are always going to disagree there's going to be something that we can't agree on but we can also always be kind considerate respectful we can agree in ways that we are not hurting each other not attacking each other and we are still taking care of basic needs of every person in our city our county our state and our world because when our basic needs are met we can be okay and if i can be okay i'm not scared i'm not hungry i'm not lacking hope and purpose i can then look at you and say are you okay and this is where maddie took it to the next level are we okay i need to be okay i need to make sure you're okay but we all need to make sure that we are okay together so have a good meeting remember peace is possible and rise to that occasion thank you mama peace out we read this proclamation, Jenny, I can say that the one thing that everyone can agree on is that we love you and Maddie. Could we get another round of applause for her, please? <laughs> we have a proclamation from the um, Montgomery County Council, whereas Maddie J.T. Stepanek, born Jan July 17, 1990, was a seven-time New York Times best-selling author, 
a lyricist and American poet, and before his death at the age of 13, he became known as a peace advocate and motivational speaker and... Uh, whereas Matty wrote six volumes of poetry on heart songs, which he described as gifts that reflect on each person's unique reason for being, as well as a collection of peace essays, all while living with a rare and fatal health condition called dysautonomic mitochondrial myopathy. Uh, and uh, whereas Matty wanted to be remembered as a poet, a peacemaker, and a philosopher who played and made a difference to millions of people by his writings, TV appearances, and music albums. Oprah Winfrey uh, named him one of her all-time most memorable guests in the 25-year history of her show and a messenger for our times. And? Whereas Maddie was a deeply spiritual and religious young man who believed his purpose was to be a messenger of hope and peace around the world and that peace is possible Peace is for all people, peace can be taught, and peace begins with deliberate choices in attitude and action. And whereas in honor of Maddie's contributions, a congressional resolution was passed in 2014 to support the Maddie J.T. Stepanek Foundation's National Peace Day campaign to have Maddie's birthday annually proclaimed as a day to learn about and celebrate peace. And? Whereas in commemoration of his life and legacy, a 26-acre namesake park and playground with a statue and a peace garden was created in 2008 in his King Farm neighborhood and the city of Rockville in partnership with the Maddie J.T. Stepanek Foundation annually celebrates Maddie's Peace Day in July. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes July 17th as Peace Day in honor of Maddie J.T. Stepanek's life and legacy of peace, which continues to gently shape our world with hope and goodwill. It's presented today, and it's signed by my colleagues, Council Member Albernaz, Council Member Lukey, uh, Council President uh, Glass, and myself. And we congratulate all. Yeah. We're gonna get a picture taken. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for that 
meaningful and moving uh, presentation. Uh, as was said, we could all use a little more uh, peace in our lives, and we need to continue striving to be our better angels, especially uh, in the political uh, discourse and in public policy conversations, and let's try to remember that as we continue today's very important conversation as well. Uh, and as we uh, took this morning to remember the memory of Maddie Stepanek, I also want to extend uh, the Council's condolences to the family of Mark Hansen. Uh, Mark Hansen was our longtime county attorney who had been in the county attorney's office for nearly four decades. Uh, and he retired in January of 2022 as the longest serving county attorney. Uh, and he served with respect and dignity uh, and an intellect that helped all of us here in Montgomery County uh, implement our laws and be thoughtful about the laws we implement. Uh, and so if we can take a moment of silence to honor the memory of Mark Hansen, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are now moving on to general business. Madam Clerk, do we have any announcements? Good morning, Mr. President, Vice President, Council Members. We have one announcement today. There's an addition to today's agenda. Item 2O has been added, a special appropriation to the FY24 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Office of the County Executive, in the, in the amount of $198,594, community use of public facilities, $60,000, and Department of Health and Human Services, $20,000 for summer and after school youth safety program. The source of funds is state grants. A public hearing and action are scheduled for July 25th. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, there are no minutes for our approval, so we are going to move straight into Legislative Day 22 and call of bills for final reading. And the first bill for final reading is Bill 2423, Air Park Community Advisory Committee established. Um, and uh, I will say that as uh, Chair of the Transportation uh, and Environment Committee, we took up uh, this bill uh, on June 26th. And the bill establishes an advisory committee to advise the county executive, the county council, the revenue authority, um, and residents on the work and impact of the Montgomery County Air Park operations. Um, the bill was uh, introduced by Councilmember Ludke, with co-sponsors being myself, Councilmembers Jawando, Albernaz, Katz, Sale, and Sales. Uh, there were several amendments that were made during the committee work session. Uh, among those amendments, they would require a report uh, for the number of touch and go flights uh, and the facilities planning operations uh, at the air park. Uh, and they would also adjust the membership of the air park advisory, com uh, air park community advisory committee to specifically include nearby communities and also pilots who use the air park um, and nearby related aviation. Uh, businesses. The committee voted 3-0 and recommends the bill with amendments. Ms. Oconee. Uh, good morning and thank you, Council President, and good morning, Council Members. Um, thank you for that introduction and for that uh, broad overview. Uh, before going, uh, b because um, the um, uh, t and &E committee unanimously recommended the bill with the amendments, so um, we of course, should walk through each amendment for um, uh, for a decision point by the council. Before doing that, I did just want to um, draw attention to the summary of impact statements, which is at uh, page three of the uh, staff packet. And I should mention at the outset, I'm stepping in for Ms. Wellens, who did all the heavy lifting, prepared the packet. I'm simply um, uh, stepping in on her behalf. So at page three of the staff packet, you have a summary of the impact statements. Uh, there was nothing, none of the impact statements noted any significant impact, whether it was the racial equity and social justice impact statement, the climate assessment, economic impact. Uh, 
On the fiscal impact, uh, it was noted in the report that establishing an air park community advisory committee is expected to have minimal impact on county expenditure. Uh, I, I would propose that we, um, I can walk through the various, uh, I, I, uh, uh, I'm not sure if we need to go through all, okay. all of the pieces of legislation, it was pretty straightforward. Sure. Um, so if that's all you want to report out and recognizing the important work that Ms. Wellens uh, has done, done. Uh, and just for um, public understanding, uh, um, Mark Hansen, the, the former county attorney, is, is Ms. Wellen's father, and so that's why she is not here today. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to the bill sponsor sure. uh, to fill out the conversation. Councilmember uh, Lutke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to thank all of the residents who started advocating for for this and for having this committee before before we even got sworn in. Um, and uh, as you'll recall, we were we were sworn in a week after the 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 plane ended up in the electrical tower. So that was hot on everyone's mind, of course, um, right as we uh, were inaugurated. Um, there have been a bunch of different issues that I have been asked about. I know other council members have been asked about over time related to noise and safety issues um, regarding the air park's usage. Um, for instance, I, I met separately with residents. I've met separately with the NAACP's Montgomery County chapter last month to talk about that because some of those members live in or around the air park and had questions. So there's a definite desire from different communities around the air park area to get this committee up and running so that it can talk through proposed solutions um, in particular to mitigate noise. And I want to thank all the bill's co-sponsors, um, Council President Glass, Albernaz, Councilmember Jawando, Councilmember Katz, and Councilmember Sales, as well as Councilmembers Balcom and Stort for uh, the T and E session that we did, um, and for the good conversation at committee working through the proposed amendments. Um, and I also want to thank Keith Miller from the Revenue Authority for taking the time to meet with us and to discuss how best to move forward in a way that's workable for everyone. Um, so, to recap, this. There was a prior committee or commission, um, the Air Park Liaison Committee, that started in 1990 and then uh, was disbanded around the same time during COVID uh, that the particular type of touch and go operations that uh, produce the most frequent flyovers in that immediate residential area started to increase. And that's based on data that was provided to the county through Vianair, uh, who was a consultant hired by the county to do a report. Um, that was commissioned last year. And it has also coincided with the fact that there have been increased noise reports related to air park operations as well. Um, and while the county government, I want to make this very clear, the county government does not have any direct authority over flight operations. That is the province of the FAA. The advisory committee and having this available, um, these are commonplace in areas uh, that surround uh, airports. Um, and large and small around the country, everywhere. Um, and it's important to help synthesize community voice and business voice around these issues and have a place to, to gather that information. Um, and I'm, I know that, um, sorry, we have, we have to take this opportunity to make sure that we are able to then take what this group does and surface it further to the state and to the FAA. Um, so I appreciate having this reinstituted, albeit in a new form. Um, I do view the air park as an important resource and economic development tool, and I believe that this committee can serve as a conversation for that as well. So thank you all for your suggestions, your support, and thank you, Council President. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Ludke. Councilmember Sales. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you to Councilmember Ludke for bringing this bill forward. Um, I was proud to co-sponsor this bill during its introduction and recognize the tremendous needs for its passage. Um, the Montgomery County Air Park, as Councilmember Ludke said, is an integral part of our local economy that needs and deserves mm -hmm. proper oversight and community engagement. One of my biggest concerns about this bill is community feedback and input. Um, when creating a committee like this, we must have members that are well informed about the issues raised by the air park. I'm glad that amendments to this bill will make the committee more geographically representative of the area. 
um, but as staff noted, it might be worth it to add more language specifying that geographic diversity means positions around the air park. And so I don't know if language was added. Additional language. Or if that will be done later. The question, Council Member? Yes, yeah, so well, in the staff packet, staff um, noted that it might be worth it to add a small amount of language specifying that geographic diversity means positions around the park because there was a discussion of east versus west. So the additional amendments that yeah. were made, and these are at page four of the staff packet, uh, and the first amendment actually titled membership amendments. The double underlined language represents what was added, and there was specifically, um, so the eight voting members include uh, three members, Previously, it said nominated by other homeowners associations, civic associations, or community groups. Following the committee work session, there's an amendment. The proposed amendment is to add who reside within a three mile radius of the air park mm -hmm. and who represent the uh, geographic diversity surrounding the air park. So that, okay. that amendment was included. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you again for the uh, language and the look forward to passing this bill. Thank you. Councilmember Albernaz. Thanks. I just wanted to uh, double tap on thanking the community's engagement and thoughtful advocacy throughout this entire process. But I also do want to thank the Revenue Authority, um, who I think has been very open to and willing to uh, mm -hmm. engage the community in a way that's authentic and addresses issues on the front end. Um, I also want to acknowledge my former Chief of Staff, Joy Nurmi, who worked very closely on this issue. Uh, before she retired and was excited to see that Councilmember Lukey had proposed this particular piece of legislation and texted me saying quickly, you got to co-sponsor this. Um, so I am, uh, th this is a, a good example of where coming together to come up with reasonable solutions to address real issues um, I think is beneficial to our entire community. So I look forward to passage of this piece of legislation. Uh, thank you, colleagues, and I also just want to uh, extend my appreciation to Councilmember Ludke for uh, introducing this bill, and incredibly important to note or double tap what she said for um, doing that, um, that there are a number of issues related to the air park that are not in our jurisdiction. Uh, it is under the domain of the uh, Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, and federal authorities and uh, our work and partnership with the Revenue Authority and our federal delegation as well who have all been plugged in to this important conversation are uh, really working to, to make sure that the uh, pilots, the businesses, and most importantly the residents uh, all feel safe and respected with those operations as they continue. So again, thank you, Councilmember Ludke, for that. Uh, I see no other speakers, so Madam Clerk, if you call the roll. Councilmember Ludke? Yes. Councilmember Ludke votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Dewando? Yes. Councilmember Dewando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much, colleagues. And thank you very much, Ms. Ciccone. <coughs> Uh, we are now going to move to our second bill for final reading this morning. That is Bill 1523, Landlord-Tenant Relations, Anti-Rent Gouging Protections. And if Ms. McCartney Green. So, I want to start this morning's conversation um, by acknowledging that every member of this council 
recognizes that renters need some level of help and protection. The various pieces of legislation that have been introduced over the last number, number of months and the public comments of every single council member has shown that something needs to be done. There is a very strong acknowledgement from this body that people are struggling to pay their rent and that there are some bad actors who are price gouging and rent gouging. I personally have heard from residents who have had their rents increased by double digits, in some cases 30, 35 percent. I've seen the letters. I know it's true. This council, through our actions, legislation, and statements, have, are all committed to making sure that double digit rent increases do not happen. I believe it is very safe to say that we're unified in saying double digit rent increases are wrong. And Montgomery County, much like other jurisdictions, also is facing a housing crisis. We want to make sure that housing here is affordable and attainable for anyone who wants it at all income levels. And according to the Council of Governments, Montgomery County needs to produce over 31,000 low-cost housing units by 2030 in order to keep up with our growing demand. And as I've said from the very beginning of this conversation, as I've said ever since I got elected to the County Council, if we want to have more housing that is affordable, we need to build more housing. That has been my guiding principle throughout this entire conversation. And I've spoken to residents who've received the double-digit rent increases and about the instability that they are facing and we know that more needs to be done to help them. And so the conversation and the legislation that is before us today is a balancing act, quite frankly. Trying to balance the needs of residents today to stay in the homes and also to not discourage future homes from being built for future residents who want them. It's important to note that Montgomery County and Montgomery County, one third of our residents are foreign born. We do, not, we do not build walls around Montgomery County. We want to continue building houses to be a beacon from around the world so people can continue moving here. And so as we enter this conversation today, as we begin this debate on this bill, I want to extend my appreciation to all of my colleagues for their earnest efforts to get us here. I know there's a lot of disagreement on the dais. There is a lot of disagreement from all those who are following this conversation. But there is universal agreement that we need to make housing more affordable. That is the underlying message for today. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to the chair of the Planning Housing Parks Committee, Vice President Friedson, for a readout. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate your comments, and uh, thank you for everybody for your work and interest on this issue. Uh, first, let me recap the Planning Housing Parks uh, Committee sessions. Uh, we uh, first had a committee panel discussion, an in-depth conversation with a wide breadth of stakeholders that was data-driven uh, in January. Uh, the committee then held two sessions. Uh, on both bills, Bills 1523 and 1623, uh, the initial being on uh, June the 15th, uh, where we dove into both bills in a very comprehensive way. We had a number of uh, other council members who joined us uh, as well as part of those discussions, and then a second on June 26th to take up motions made by committee members. On the 26th, multiple amendments were adopted uh, to Bill 1523. Uh, including changing the rent increase allowance from 8% plus CPI as introduced to 3% plus CPI U with a 6% uh, overall cap, adding language to allow for fair return increases uh, applications uh, via re method two regulations, uh, eliminating the exemption for single family homes and condominiums, adjusting the capital improvements surcharge section to include and account for federal, state, and local mandates, county attorney technical amendments, uh, as well as adding a transition clause to handle existing notices that have yet to take effect uh, at the time of the bill's uh, passage and effective date. 
I'll just uh, turn it over to Miss uh, 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 Miss McCartney Green uh, to add anything that I haven't, and then if, uh, I'm happy to uh, close this out and yield it back to you, Mr. President. Good morning, Council. I, I think you summarized that very well, um, Council Vice President Friesen. So that that ends the report out. Yeah. Great. So thank you for that. Thank you to all the work that you put in. We had two staff members that each worked on the separate bills that were part of our conversations. I want to thank Ms. Wellens as well, who really was the primary staff lead on uh, Bill 1523. Ms. McCartney Green was the primary staff lead on Bill 1623. Thank both of you for the considerable amount of work that you put into it. Also want to acknowledge DHCA that was at all of our sessions and provided significant feedback and we very much appreciate that as well as well as OLO uh, who is here today for colleagues to answer any questions uh, and we took up their uh, report that was requested by the previous council the previous Fed uh, committee uh, with that I just uh, want to note I was an initial co-sponsor of 1523 uh, a few months ago six council members uh, came together and compromised to get to our initial launching point, uh, when we developed 1523, we looked at national models for areas that struck a balance between uh, renter protections and uh, inability for the housing market to, to grow and to continue to build. Uh, the original bill was based off of that. Uh, as discussed, the, the, the bill as amended in committee takes a different approach. It uh, really adopts many of the provisions uh, uh, much closer to Bill 1623. Uh, and I am concerned uh, that it uh, threatens the balance that we were initially trying to achieve in the initial approach that we were uh, uh, attempting uh, to uh, take. So uh, I removed my name and, and three other council members have removed their name uh, from this bill given the fact that it uh, does uh, take a uh, different uh, approach uh, based on the fact that I am concerned that the approach could exacerbate the very problems that we're trying to solve. We are in a housing crisis. We don't have enough supply compared to demand. And as a result, housing units are unaffordable to far too many people. And the power dynamic is with landlords who control limited supply of what residents and families need. I believe that the primary way to solve this issue of the long term is to build more housing at all levels of affordability. And I do think that our decisions today will have a significant impact on the county for decades to come. This council and the previous council, I believe over the last five years has done more to address housing than any other five-year period in the county's history. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to work on, with each and every one of you uh, on those issues. But I am concerned that however well-intentioned we may be, our decisions today could risk that progress. I just will close and say that personally, I have evolved quite a bit on this issue hearing from residents about some shocking and excessive rent increases. I do believe those come from a relatively small number of very bad actors, as the data indicates. And uh, I had indicated to colleagues that I was willing to go to 6% uh, plus CPI with a 9% cap to avoid the double digit increases. I think the council president was uh, noting that this is uh, in a, in, in evolution for me personally on the county's involvement in housing that we desperately uh, need uh, more of. But I uh, do believe that it's important that we look at targeted challenges with scalpel as opposed to hammer uh, approaches. And that is the way in which I have approached this issue and the reason why uh, I uh, have ultimately removed my name uh, from the bill because it does take a, a significantly different approach than the one that was introduced uh, and why I respectfully uh, voted no uh, at committee. But uh, it was a two to one committee uh, vote. Uh, that uh, committee recommendation is before uh, the body. And with that, Mr. President, I will turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Vice President Friedson. Thank you, um, Ms. McCartney Green. Uh, and uh, colleagues, just so everybody is aware, uh, in our packet, I had asked for everybody to uh, submit their amendment so we could have uh, a thoughtful, data driven, deliberative conversation. And so in the staff packet are the amendments in the order in which we're going to discuss them. Uh, and so at this point in time, before we start working through all of those various amendments, I welcome any opening comments uh, colleagues might have. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I am very excited. I'm just gonna put it out there. I am very happy. I am proud that this council is is came together to this state to have a permanent solution 
for to protect tenants in Montgomery County. And I think uh, we have the responsibility to walk the talk. We love to say that Montgomery County is so progressive. This is walking the talk. I'm unhappy with every single amendment that has been presented. No. I'm unhappy even with this version of the PHP committee, which I am a proud member of. No. But you know what? I am here as an elected official. I am here to pass something that will move us forward and evolve this county that I call home. I'm the only immigrant here, and I'm telling you, I am so proud to live in this country where I can make changes that will benefit my family, my neighbors, my kids' friends, and so on. That is our responsibility. So we are gonna have pretty strong disagreement on some of these amendments, but that's okay. That's the beauty of democracy. I will be so bored if I have people that agree with me all the time. My husband doesn't even do that. I will divorce him. And and I, you know, I'm a member of PHP. I don't think anybody here has the experience that I have on development. No one. I come from the Planning Commission. No one. And I'm going to tell you one thing. There is no such thing as the development community says this. It's not true. They all have different views. I've had developers coming to me and saying, Natalie, three with a cup at six, we don't like it, but we can live with it. Okay? It's true. So there's no such thing as developers are the devil and they all are rich white people. Well, um, there's a variety. <laughs> and, and the same thing with the hard left. I'm a progressive. I'm more lefty than people realized. But I also know that it takes two to tango and that it's not my way in the highway. I will never pass legislation or move forward on something just to get the headline. That is not me. That will never be me. I compromise. That's my duty. Otherwise, I am here just warming up a seed and saying yes to everybody without passing anything. Okay? So I am a member of the PHP committee, but I'm also the chair of the Economic Development Committee for this county council. And, and that means taking care of the workforce. It's not just about having people live in this county, it's about, or working in this county, it's about making sure they can live and afford living in this county. That's a workforce issue. I cannot just see the development side. I have to see the workforce side. That's my duty. And with that, I won't say anything else because I see the look. And I, I am so ready to move on on these amendments. I will not comment on some of them because it's just not worth it. I'm just going to say no. And um, yes, on some of them. So that's it. Back to you, Mr. President. That was the look of listening, active listening. Uh, Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. Uh, we were the, the two that were tangoing on PHP to pe put this bill forward. I appreciate also Councilmember Friesen's uh, leadership of the committee. Uh, he said we would have a fair, open, honest discussion of the bills, and we did. Um, and uh, we put them forward in the democratic process, and here we are. I want to thank Ms. Uh, Ms. McCartney-Green and Ms. Wellens in her absence. Um, for their work uh, on the Home Act and on the anti rent gouging bill, um, this was a, this is the definition of a compromise. Um, we had two very different bills with different rates and different provisions. The Home Act was a three percent cap or inflation, whichever was lower. The anti rent gouging bill was a 50, uh, eight percent plus inflation, um, and we ended up in the middle. Um, and it is a, it is the definition of a compromise. We heard testimony from some people actually who are in this room today, uh, months ago, about how six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent increases were forcing them to make decisions to self-evict and to move. Um, and I just want to remind people that uh, our DHCA for years has considered a ten percent increase to be constructive eviction. If you pay two thousand dollars a month, and good luck finding that in Montgomery County right now. 10% is $200 extra. It's a whole another mortgage payment in that year. Most Americans cannot find $300 in an emergency. 
forty percent, nearly forty percent of our county rents. That's over four hundred thousand of our residents. Disproportionately black, Latino, and immigrant. Almost sixty percent of black residents rent. I was one of those kids for the first twenty some odd years of my life who had to move from substandard housing to try to find rents that allowed my mom to be able to support our family. This is not a theoretical exercise. Um, if we want to maintain four of the top 10 most diverse cities in the country, we have to protect tenants. They divert, deserve the same stability that everyone else who has a 30 year mortgage gets to know what their rent, what their mortgage is going to go up every year. I'm really proud of this bill. It's not perfect. Um, I think it's absolutely true. Uh, that this will not impact the market. Fifty years ago, uh, this council passed emergency rent regulation, decided to sunset the law. Uh, we passed voluntary rent guidelines. We passed two forms of stabilization that I authored during the pandemic. The sky did not fall. Housing is being built. This is a great place to live. It will continue to be built, regardless of the actions taken here today. The question is, will we protect our diverse community and folks who are most vulnerable? In the PHP committee yesterday, we had a very important discussion. This has been a very, uh, not ironic, but I think appropriate last week. We had a two day racial equity retreat and we talked about the policies of exclusionary zoning and intentional policy and law decisions that kept people of color and low income people uh, out of housing. Uh, we had a presentation yesterday about redlining here in Montgomery County and how that impacted our community. Um, rental practices and fees are part of that larger story. The vast majority of landlords do the right thing. That's another reason why this will not impact the market. Uh, over the last 10 years, the average rent increase was around 2%, well below what this bill caps at. So I just uh, think we need to remember that today. Uh, I won't be supporting many of these amendments because I think the bill that came out was a compromise, but we'll have a robust discussion and we will make progress on behalf of our nearly 400,000 residents who need it right now. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Albernas. All right, happy Peace Day. Uh, I want to begin um, by thanking you, Council President, for acknowledging the loss of Mark Hansen. Um, Mark was a dear friend um, who really took me under his wing uh, my first term working for the administration of Ike Leggett and was an incredible guidepost for me. Uh, I'm so proud that Christine has continued his legacy of public service on behalf of all of the residents here of Montgomery County and Mark represented the best of the best in public service and he will be deeply, deeply missed. So um, I do also um, want to thank the PHP committee for their thoughtful deliberation. I want to thank the many advocates who have contacted our offices and who have passionately advocated on all sides of this critically important issue. And I also think the council president said well that what we are trying to do today is to strike a reasonable balance to protect tenants, protect our most vulnerable populations so that they can continue to benefit from the many housing options here in Montgomery County while also striking a balance and acknowledging, as we all have, that we have very aggressive um, building goals for additional housing here in Montgomery County. But I want to provide the context from which I have looked at this issue uh, and the lens that I have looked at this issue as we go through the various amendments, several of which I have proposed this morning. And I want to acknowledge something interesting. So the state of California from 2018 to 2022 spent $17.5 billion to address homelessness in the state. The state of California needs 2.5 million units to be able to address the housing needs of the state as a whole. And the senior advisor to Governor Newsom on housing matters, uh, and Governor Newsom has made addressing homelessness his number one policy priority issue, said, and I quote, uh, this is a problem that is decades in the making because of policy choices that we have made. At the end of the day, if we want to truly solve homelessness in America, we need more housing. California has some of the most aggressive rent stabilization and control policies in the country. San Francisco, San Jose, Los Angeles, 
um, have all established rent control for decades. And yet, despite all of that, California's homeless population is growing at a rate higher than any other state in the country. And so the issue is complex, but at the heart of it, as the advisor to Governor, Governor Newsom said, we need more housing. In Montgomery County, the Council of Governments has projected a housing target for Montgomery County to meet the needs of our future residents at 31,000 units by 2030. 31,000 units by 2030. That's 31,000 units not just to meet with the population surges that we anticipate, but it's also to help make sure that we have a diverse economy, that we have housing options at all levels, so that while we are trying to help and support the retired county resident who's on a fixed income stay in their home, we're also trying to help the freshman who's in college right now who's crushing it at the University of Maryland and wants to work in Montgomery County in the biomedical sciences field but needs a place to be able to live. We have to strike a balance between both issues. And I'm deeply concerned that what has come out of committee is not as balanced as it needs to be. We have already seen evidence just in the last few weeks, unfortunately, that there are development projects that are critical to our future economic uh, opportunity and development here in Montgomery County that have been pulled. And it's not because, it's because we are in a highly competitive market. We are competing not just with Northern Virginia, but we are competing with states around the country for additional development. And so I think we'd be naive to think that this isn't going to have a substantial impact on the possibility of future growth in the county, which will have a cascading negative effect for generations. We are playing with fire this morning. And so we have to be very cautious and deliberative as we go through this process. Uh, in the same retreat that Councilmember Jawando talked about last week, I shared with colleagues, and I mean this sincerely from the bottom of my heart, the deep respect I have for each of you. I know in my soul that each of us have the same goal, the same intention, to support our most vulnerable residents and leave this county a little bit better than we found it. That's our charge, that's our responsibility. And these decisions are tough, they're complicated, they're hard, they're emotional. But we've gotta be really careful. Because if we're not, we are gonna set ourselves back in a way that will be difficult for us to be able to overcome. And so I look forward to uh, the robust discussion. And I'll also just end with, with this note. Um, I have received those same letters. I've had those same conversations. It is real that there has been rent gouging, especially in the last two years. A lot of it can be attributed to the fact that, and I voted both times for our former body to provide the longest regional um, rent stabilization at the time during COVID, uh, dissuading our landlords from being able to increase their rents during that time. As inflation was increasing, as challenges with properties were increasing, as finding employees to be able to fill positions was increasing. So it's not a huge surprise that there was a significant increase. But the unscrupulous landlords who are off the grid are probably, regardless of what we go do today, still going to take advantage of our most vulnerable residents, despite whatever tools we try to establish. And so the evidence of a systemic problem has not been very clear. Um, but we're about to pass sweeping legislation to address an issue that has not been presented as a systemic issue. And we're doing it across the board, whether we've got luxury apartments or not. And so I, I am just as progressive as everybody here, but what we're about to do later this morning, whether people can afford to do this or not, uh, is, is going to be a challenge. So uh, I just wanted to um, you know, share those thoughts, provide that context as we go through this discussion, and I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Of all the legislation I've been involved in over the years, it's been a few, 
it's certainly this one is certainly one of the most significant pieces of legislation that i've been involved in and has it as has been no secret i personally have wrestled with it this is a complex problem no simple solution is going to solve this topic and sometimes for complex problems you need a series of simple solutions to get you there and i think in some cases this is where we are we all have listened and 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 learned and heard from people who agree and disagree we've heard from residents of all ages seniors on fixed income people who struggle to make ends meet people who believe that we should just listen to them and and, and be concerned but not as concerned about what others have to say only what they have to say and we've heard from property owners who have said that if we do this they will not build that they they uh, well it, it's easier to build someplace else uh, they, they uh, uh, will will decide that that uh, they're not going to be back in, in Montgomery County to build make no mistake and I mean this sincerely every one of my colleagues is sincere and we are walking on a tightrope we want to be fair and we've heard from those who think we are being fair and from those who say we are not I too was an original co-sponsor of 1523 and remain so I too have evolved on this issue and have learned and literally literally struggled on what are the best solutions I think we need to pass this legislation I think we need to have some amendments and I think some are sensible and perhaps it would be better if they were tweaked a little bit and we'll have those discussions but I think we need to have the discussion in this forum in an open forum to actually have what is best I think this could affect the market I agree with that but I also think some of that will be short term and some are going to be longer term we need to make certain people who rent have protections and we need to make certain that a landlord realizes that their return on investment is a good investment while we walk that tightrope we have a county council that is not going to agree on every topic of this amendment that's my prediction but I know that good honorable people can look at the same topic and disagree and they can do it in an agreeable for, uh, uh, way but I also believe that we are doing what is best for this topic you know I go back to dealing with the development community it ha that has nothing to do with residential so it's an easy illustration to make but years ago in Gaithersburg when Rio was being developed the city of Gaithersburg said that we wanted we didn't want to see a parking in a, in a big box store or a larger store we wanted it to be walkable we wanted it to to be somebody could park their car and walk from one place to another and the people who owned Rio at that time were not happy that we decided to do that they were in fact not happy under you can underline the word not a lot of times but what we did do is we said we want you here we want your development here we want to work with you but sit down with us and come up with better solutions and the outcome of that candidly was that the Target store uh, realized that they could get a, a uh, escalator for a, for a shopping cart and that was the first two-story Target that was ever built in America was built at Rio and it started out in an adversarial way I don't want the adversarial way but I do believe if we can sit down as a community and they've always heard me say a community is a family if we can sit down as a family and come up not to be adversarial but come up with a way once this legislation is passed and we tweak some of the amendments that we can come away with something that all sides might not applaud but all sides understand how we got there and will continue to work with us that's my goal and I thank you very much mr. president thank you councilmember Katz councilmember Mink
Thank you to my colleagues for all of those thoughtful comments uh, and for all the work that has gone into the bill uh, and the deliberations that have brought us to this point. Um, I wanted to actually first say something, if I may, a uh, point of privilege. Um, a number of us were at uh, a graduation of uh, an incoming class of firefighters recently, and in the introductory remarks, they said something really lovely that I hadn't heard before, uh, which was there were, of course, a bunch of kids there and babies who were making some noise. Uh, and they said, listen, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Don't be stressed out about it. We're glad you're here. You're part of this. You're part of our community. Be the babies that you are. Be the toddlers that you are. Be the parents that you are. It's OK. And I think it helped all of us to, to feel a little more relaxed. And uh, so I would like to, if I may, um, point of privilege uh, to say also we, we understand and we're glad you're here to, to the little ones uh, and the parents. Um, and then I want to get to I want to get to the discussions, but I'll just briefly note that um, we have um, uh, it, when we were at that um, racial equity social justice training together, uh, one of the things that we talked about was you know how do you approach thinking about these issues? Do you kind of start on the on the heart side of things or on the intellectual side of things? And we had some really good conversations that helped us get to know each other better. And one of the things that strikes me about, um, and, I, and absolutely I believe that we're all coming from a good place here, absolutely. Um, one of the things that strikes me about making this issue so difficult is that there's very strong uh, emotional pulls on uh, you know, both sides of, of, this, of this issue. Um, you know, there is, there is deep-seated fear about disrupting our economy, disrupting our, uh, uh, you know, develop, de you know, development, all of that. Um, that's a, that's a real, real tangible, uh, fear and concern. We do not want to screw those things up. Um, and, uh, and we don't want to, and we don't want to, you know, disappoint the partners who have helped us, you know, in all the development that we've been doing so far and, and who continue to, you know, to work with us in that. Um, and we also, obviously, there's a very strong emotional pull from folks who are in this room with us right now and who are representing many more who are just trying to stay housed and trying to help their neighbors stay housed and who are representing many thousands um, of, of tenants across our county who want to be able to not only stay in their homes but to not be cost burdened, not to be rent burden, burdened, to be able to pay for the things that their kids need, uh, to be able to pay their, their other bills, pay for summer camp, all of those types of things which benefit all of us as well. Um, so there are just a lot of strong emotional pulls coming from both sides and I think we've all recognized that we can't just make an emotional decision here. If we did, we would end up at one side of the spectrum or another. Um, so while it's important to keep those perspectives in mind, ultimately we need to be making uh, you know, research-based, data-based decisions, doing the very best we can to keep people housed while ensuring that we are continuing development. And I think that what came out of the PHP committee uh, was a reasonable compromise. I would have felt comfortable with the research having us a little bit lower on, on some things. Other people would have had us been more comfortable with us a little higher. But I think we're at a place that is a reasonable compromise. There's a couple of things that we need to get through today. Um, but I appreciate being, being able to go through them, discuss the facts, discuss the research in this open forum, uh, and hopefully get this done and in a good place. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to start by thanking my colleagues um, who sponsored both rent stabilization bills and the Planning House Parks Committee for their thorough work on these two bills. Um, I'd also like to thank our council staff and the Office of Legislative Oversight for conducting a deep analysis of the effects of rent stabilization in our county. Moreover, I want to thank the county for actively engaging on this issue. Over the last year, we have heard passionate testimony from hundreds of residents, landlords, labor organizations, and trade associations through phone calls, emails, and letters on personal and virtual platforms. Your presence here today reminds me just how important housing is in our increasingly urban community from retaining our current housing, affordable housing supply, to increasing our overall inventory of quality, affordable housing. 
I'm glad the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee had two work sessions on these bills. At the se second work session, I submitted a memo uh, detailing my current position to my colleagues based on conversations with various stakeholders and reviewing correspondence from constituents and other interested parties. I have found that the double digit increases my colleagues have already mentioned proposed under the anti-rent gouging bill are far too high to warrant its long-term consideration. I am also concerned that the 3% cap in the Home Act could have unintended consequences that cooled the housing market. To that end, I would like to re-emphasize my support for a cap of around 5 or 6%. It would be unreasonable to increase the cap beyond that, mainly due to our affordable housing supply shortage and the growing number of rent burdened residents. While this number is not ideal, I believe it is an excellent middle ground that balances the needs of developers with renters. Lastly, while the Planning, Housing and Parks Committee deliberated these two pieces of legislation over the committee work sessions, we have looked at this issue from many perspectives. Change is not easy, and change does not always feel good either. I recall standing in this audience over a decade ago when we passed a $15 minimum wage, and most opponents said businesses would leave our county in droves. Yet I'm joining my colleagues at Ribbon Cuttings every day in this county. I am proud that our residents, especially our youth, are being offered job opportunities that pay over $15 an hour to avoid the dangers of ill-advised decisions. These are policies that place our values at the forefront and help everyone on their path to self-sufficiency. In my position of being a lawmaker and practicing oversight, I am reminded of the compassionate policy decisions that brought me to this county. As a former affordable housing resident, safe, quality, transit-oriented development housing allowed me to access resources and job opportunities to ensure a pathway out of poverty and to make it my priority to introduce my first ZTA 2302, which is on the agenda this afternoon, so you're more than welcome to stay which will accelerate the development of economically and amenity-rich neighborhoods that provide a reasonable amount of affordable housing. I look forward to our respectful and extensive dialogue throughout today's discussion of each amendment while prioritizing parameters and guardrails to establish a framework for keeping our residents housed and our working families on pathways to home ownership and periodically reviewing the rental housing market to assess conditions and review and adjust policies to meet the needs of our renters and our landlords. Thank you, Mr. President, I yield. Thank you, Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank my colleagues for their statements this morning. I'm going to have more to say when we finish our discussion. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, we've got a lot of decisions to make, and uh, so we're ready to go. Thanks. Ready to go. Councilmember Stewart. Yes, I just want to echo uh, Councilmember Balcom and just say thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to the, the county staff uh, for all their work on this and all the residents who have come out. Um, you know, I just wanted to say, as the council member representing District 4, which has the most renters in the county, the outcome of the work that we have been doing over these last few months and that all of you have been doing for a long time really does impact the residents I represent. And, you know, just to underscore, as people have said before, this is not the only policy we need to work on to uh, solve our affordable housing crisis, but this is so very important. And the reason it is so very important is because it will provide stability and predictability for people who rent in our community. And stability is so important as we think about our communities and given all that is going on in our country, in our world right now. And to be able to lessen the anxiety about what rent increases may be, and as Council President um, said so well, for those bad actors out there, 
who are raising rents double digits to make sure that our residents aren't facing that and aren't even facing the prospect of that is very important. Um, and so stability is really important as we're looking at this policy. And I look forward to discussing the amendments. I want to thank particularly the staff of uh, OLO for their excellent report and research um, that they did on this topic. I think it was very helpful uh, to inform where we've gotten today and will inform our discussion um, this, after this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are 14 amendments that have been submitted that are in our packet, and we are going to start working through them uh, right now with uh, Ms. McCartney Green and colleagues. Uh, we do have DHCA here, we do have OLO here, and so at any point in time we want to bring them into the conversation. Uh, they are here to participate. Uh, and so uh, let's go through the first amendment, which is a technical amendment. Ms. McCartney-Green. Thank you, uh, Council President. And as mentioned, there are 14, actually 15 amendments with DHEA's amendment, and we'll talk about that um, ahead of the council member sponsored amendments. Uh, so number one was the transition clause. Uh, during our uh, PHP committee work session on June 26, uh, there was discussion of um, having the bill effective, but also have regulations that would complement the bill. Uh, the question was whether or not what would be effective first and what would happen. Uh, as a result of that conversation, council staff is recommending an amendment for a transition clause that would read that the requirements of this act must not apply and must not be enforced until the method two regulations required on the act take effect. We think that this would be helpful to basically put a pause on implementation of the bill until those method two regulations are approved by this council. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Jamondo. Thank you. Yes, we did discuss this in PHP. I just want, would like to clarify, and I'm probably going to ask Director Bruton, I think you just come on up now for this one, and just, and, and just get, get a tent. Um, obviously, we said that we wanted the Method 2 regulations and that you would get those to us in a timely fashion, so I want you to talk about that. But I think we could parse out here that the only the things that required method two regulations would need to have this delay and you know for example the cap itself uh, so I just want to understand from 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 staff does this apply for example to the cap itself and so previously also at that same work session we talked about a rent increase notice transition and that's on uh, page eight and so with that notice provision the cap would still be in effect um, at the passage of this bill or the regulations. Okay. And so regardless if a landlord, you know, attempted to increase the rent between the council adopting it today and the regulations, that transition clause uh, makes sure that the cap stays into effect as of now. Okay. Is that clear? That is clear. And I think Councilmember Mink was the one that um, inspired that uh, amendment at the last. Okay. So I don't need to amend this. To, that is already within what we're going to do later. Okay, that's yep. what I just wanted to make sure. There is an effective date yeah. uh, amendment that will come later. Yeah. Right. Thank this you. is technical in nature. Uh, Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Uh, we're just going to say that I discussed this with staff and I in complete agreement as is written. So. Thank you. Council Member Albernaz. Um, so just a, sorry, just a couple questions for Mr. Bruton. So I know this is tied to the addition of eight additional staff members um, who will then be responsible for oversight of the um, of whatever it is we pass today uh, it takes a long time to hire people in Montgomery County um, it takes a hard long time to recruit it takes a long time to hire uh, we're talking months if not years in some instances so what will be the plan in during the transition as the regulations come over and we'll deliberate those but capacity is a concern within DHCA right now um, to be for you all to be able to administer the policies that are already on the books and you've testified and previous directors have testified regarding those challenges so what would the plan be until we have those eight individuals on board thank you that is an excellent question really appreciate it um, I've already been in discussions uh, with the county executive's office uh, there's there's really three parts I, I think to what we've been uh, trying to build up in anticipation if you all pass this law today 
Uh, the first is the staffing issue. Uh, I've already been in touch with the county executive staff about putting together a supplemental request for the funding that would be necessary um, and already talked um, about the HR requirements to uh, try to expedite the hiring of these. Um, I think while we will need uh, eight-ish staff uh, to fully implement, we can, we can prioritize the most essential staff um, in the hiring process and then move forward. Um, the second, I'll come back to the staffing. Uh, the second part is making sure the regulations done, are done in a timely fashion. And I, talk, I uh, talked with the Office of the County Attorney and Cliff Royalty, who's one of their senior folks uh, dealing with legislation and regulation, he's committed to give me significant time uh, in collaboration to produce the regulations in a timely fashion to meet the timelines that are contemplated in the legislation as amended. And then the third part, which we will ultimately want to have uh, a computerized database system uh, in order to facilitate uh, the recording of rents and the tracking of things. And I've discussed that with TEBS, and TEBS has indicated that they are, because of the nature of the legislation and the importance, able to do that for us at no charge. Um, so reducing the cost burden uh, for us. And we have already been in discussions about how we can uh, facilitate the completion of the necessary database and portal uh, to make this as easy as possible for staff as well as um, uh, the landlords of the county. That's helpful. I just encourage you in that transition, because I've been in county government a long time. I know how these things go. Um, maybe in the supplemental you can also include, if you feel it's necessary, to bring in some outside help in the short term um, to help facilitate and make sure the process flows so that we don't hold up any potential renovation projects that will benefit the residents of the properties that want to be able to make that transition. Um, and I would also strongly encourage you and request um, that you engage all stakeholders as you develop those regulations to make sure this is a win-win and a two-way street. We want to encourage investment in properties um, and that we have a streamlined process that's clear, that's easy to follow, that's not ambiguous um, because that is a problem in many other categories and areas uh, and, and we, we want to make sure we don't compound uh, some of the barriers that may already exist. So I'll just thank you for that recommendation. I, I fully commit to doing that. In my the work I've done for the past decade, I represented both affordable homeless pre prevention, affordable housing advocates, as well as affordable housing developers. And part of what I was tasked with doing for that decade was to bring people together to try to build consensus around things. And so, as I've mentioned in discussing with a variety of council members who've asked me questions over the past weeks, um, I am very committed to bringing in stakeholders uh, to get their points of view and input uh, to try to minimize the unintended consequences and to try to make this process as easy and seamless as, as we can in implementing the law. And just a process question um, for colleagues or Ms. Ms. McCartney Green, will this come back before the PHP committee, the method two regulations, or will it come back before the full body? It would come back before the full body, the council. Okay. Full body. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. I just have a process question. <laughs> um, and, and I know there's a, a subsequent amendment later that my colleague uh, has put forward. And so whether it what, if that goes, then the bill would be effective 91 days post passage. Um, if it's as is and it's currently written, it would be six months post passage. But there was something inherent in Councilmember Jawando's question that made me want to get clarification. Um, so parts of the bill can't go into effect on one day and other parts on another, correct? That's correct. Okay. So. Um, I know we'll take up the other piece of it later, but for this purpose right now, it would, it would by accepting this amendment on the transition period, it would, if, if in fact expedited uh, 91 days is our subsequent decision, the regulations, I know you're committed to trying to make them ready as soon as possible, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And I think you all saw in the material that mm -hmm. I had submitted before, mm -hmm. we're well on our way already right. to having draft, but those will be altered and changed through uh, stakeholder input. Okay. So I just wanted to make it clear that whatever our ultimate decision is later about the effective date, approving this transition clause 
the goal is that none of it goes into effect until the regulations are um, ready and take effect because they have to go together hand in hand, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank and you I'm, Mr. President. I'm prepared to go through the timeline of what the effective date will be, but I want to be respectful and, and do that towards yeah, the end. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Friedson. Yeah, I was going to ask a similar question. The original amendment was if a landlord notifies a tenant prior to the effective date of this act or to the effective date of Method 2 regulations, so one or the other regulations adopted under this act of a rent increase that would occur after the effective date of the act or of the regulation. So it uses or. And so what you're essentially proposing is to make that and. It would have to, it, they would not go into effect until both the effective date and the method two regulations are adopted by the council. Yeah, and I want to make sure we're clear so we're on the same page. And so what's on the packet in page six is talking about the transition clause of just the regulation. Uh, Council Vice President Friedson is raising a good point of what's already been adopted by the prior um, PHP committee, and that's on page eight, and that's talking about the notices in the transition. And so I would agree with Council uh, Vice President Friedson that that would be an and if we go ahead and accept the transition clause that is on page Yeah, because the important point is a landlord doesn't change the rent under law. They're not legally allowed to change the rent the next day. There's a notice requirement. And so there's right. two transitions that the body needs to take up. One is the effective date of when an issue, of when a notice can be issued, mm -hmm. and the other is when a notice would take effect. And so I just want to make sure that everybody understands that there are really two transitions that need to be approved in a final bill. That's correct. Any clarifications? Okay. Uh, Colleagues, this was a uh, staff amendment. Is there a motion to adopt? So yes. move. Second. Moved by Council Member Fonny Gonzalez, seconded by Council Member Sales. All of those in favor of this amendment? And that's unanimous. Good start. <laughs> <laughs> Peace day. Live it up. Live it up. Let's keep it up. On to amendment number two. I'll turn it over to Council Member Alvernos. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Council, so obviously I'm, I'm, there was I'm very. I want to make sure we, we address the other technical amendment that's out from DHCA, and then we can. Um, sure. If that's okay with you. Sure. And so looking at circle page 203, um, the council received an amendment, a request from DHCA uh, that would amend 1523, uh, essentially deleting um, section uh, 2961, and that's the annual reporting requirement. Um, already in the county code, there is an annual reporting um, that's required by landlords each year. Um, my understanding is that DHCA has taken a look at it and realized that the same requirements that's being required here in 1523 um, can be met in, in uh, our existing law. I'm going to let Scott. Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, we, we don't want to burden landlords or DHC staff any more than we need to. Uh, we have, as you all are familiar, the annual reporting requirements in the uh, annual rent survey. Uh, the, it, it's very similar to the reporting requirements here. Um, and so we believe they would re be redundant and burdensome and unnecessary. That said, uh, the OLO report, as everybody's been saying today, very good OLO report, uh, made uh, several good recommendations about how we could improve upon our day together with the annual rent survey. And so we're committed to coming back to you with some amendments for Section 2951, which is the annual rent survey, um, in order to make those recommended changes and improve things. And we can put any little tweaks we need to better facilitate data collection for the Rent Stabilization Act into those amendments. Um, I see colleagues have comments on this, and I appreciate the amendment, uh, Director Bruton. Uh, from my perspective, it is extremely important for this legislation to state that there is going to be future data to review uh, on all sides. And I understand the department's concern about uh, duplication of efforts uh, and about staff capacity. I personally would feel more comfortable if the legislation, this legislation, explicitly referred to a collection of data. Uh, not wanting to be duplicative on your end, um, if it can be uh, additive um, or just for the sake of explicitly stating that there is data to review for future consideration. So I don't know if that, uh, if there's an amendment to your proposal 
um, or if, as written in the law, in the bill, um, there is no other work for DHCA to actually do. Sure, we would we would welcome that. We 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 agree that it would be very valuable to uh, to track data um, for everyone's concerns about how you know what are the impacts over time of the legislation. And so we absolutely agree. If you all would like, if the council staff would like to make uh, a, an amendment to that that just specifies that the you know data would be made, we're, we're fine with that. Ed McCartney Green. Uh, agreed, and that's something that can be done here uh, as making an amendment um, that, as required under Section 2951, any annual reporting requirements would also be subject to the requirements that are here in, in Bill 1523. Yeah. I can definitely draft that up. I would be, rather than removing the requirement, I would rather, I would prefer to keep it in, in the legislation. Councilmember Pani Gonzalez. I have discussed this with uh, Mr. Britton, and I move uh, this amendment forward as amended just by now. Okay, uh, so moved by Councilmember Fonny Gonzalez, seconded by Councilmember Jawando. Uh, Councilmember, uh, we're moving around here. Councilmember Ludke. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, I was just going to say that um, as noting, you know, no one wants duplicative stuff and it's great to have everything all in one place. I'm all in favor of efficiencies, but I also love data, so I don't want to miss anything. But I note that, um, the, it, and this can be, as you noted in the, uh, this will fix this, but we should delete this piece here, correct, per Council Member Fanny Gonzalez's motion, except as amended Th that you just did. Yes? This is a, a separate amendment from the transition. That yes, we're adding. It's un but the, the amendment that DHCA has proposed is actually a deletion. So, um, yes. And, we're, yes. and we're good yes. with that. Yes. And I note that you can include in the regulations as you develop them and clean up that th this data is part and parcel of the same and to be included, it would be then very clearly spelled out in the regulatory scheme. Yes, and okay. we, we come back to you yeah. all, so you'll get a second bite at the apple on that. All right, thank you. I think we're all good on this. So all those in favor of Council Member Fonny Gonzalez's uh, proposal, motion, and that is unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Bruton. Thank you, Ms. McCartney-Green. Okay, back to regularly scheduled programming. The amendments that are in the packet, uh, the second amendment, I'll turn it over to Council Member Albernaz. Okay, so um, I, again, appreciate the thoughtful deliberation and to go from the double digit in the one bill to the single digit in the other bill. I'll acknowledge there have been talking points in us wanting to have a regional approach uh, as we address this issue, but at 6%, um, we will have the most aggressive rent cap I believe uh, when when to, it will be higher than Tacoma Parks and the District of Columbia's when discussing the other exemptions um, will not necessarily be consistent with what the District of Columbia has pursued. So, Mr. Bruton, could you talk a little bit about what the six percent, how that would uh, connect to other parts of the region that have rent stabilization bills? Sure. So Prince George's County uh, currently has a, a one year, uh, and their, their cap is 3%. DC, um, their long running cap has been 10%, but they passed legislation recently that for the next two years, they will be capped at 6% per year. Um, and. The, it remains to be seen if they will extend that. There was a significant amount of political pressure, and so that 6% cap may or may not be extended beyond the two years. Thank you. But there's a sunset for both of those uh, pieces of legislation. Uh, for, the, for Prince George's and the District of Columbia with what they recently passed. Correct. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm concerned, as we've said before, about the significant tipping of the scales. I also didn't mention in my opening comments the potential for the opportunity cost here. Um, we spent two years going through the Vision 2030 exercise, uh, 2050 exercise, to uh, hear from community stakeholders. And for a year of those two years, I was council president, um, and I got crushed from all sides um, on that issue. Um, advocates who didn't want there to be the growth that was ultimately proposed in the vision document while others feeling it needed to be more aggressive than it should be. And my concern is, is that if we're not careful, um, 
what we passed will be not much more than words on a page because we will need the development to go along with the recommendations made and set forth through vision which was opposed by the county executive um, but that will be critical in ensuring that we meet that 30,000 plus housing requirement moving forward. We also have this unique opportunity of an interest in property owners in converting commercial space to residential. We've also seen some evidence of, because this ebbs and flows, a migration outside of the District of Columbia coming back to the suburbs where we had seen the opposite trend for the last 15 years. So my concern is, is that again, if we tip the scales too far in one direction, then we miss that opportunity to over the next 10 years be even more aggressive than we have been uh, in partnering with our development community to meet the housing requirements that we all acknowledge that we need. And so for that reason, uh, I believe 9% is um, more consistent with that and more reasonable, and I'd like to move that forward as a cap. Councilmember Almanaros has moved 9% uh, hard cap. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Balcom. Comments? Okay, um, I will simply say that I understand uh, the intention of, of the amendment, uh, and that is to limit any increases um, below double digits, and that is something that I have long said that we should not do. It is unconscionable to have uh, certain double digit rent increases as we've experienced, and while I support that goal, a majority of this council is already on the record and has already voiced their support for the proposal that is in the bill, that is CPI plus 3% capped at six, and so I view this amendment as moot and I will not be supporting it. Not saying anything else, uh, all those in favor of the proposal, of the motion, raise your hand. All those opposed, and the motion fails. <laughs> Next amendment, I'm gonna turn it over to Councilmember Mink. Thank you. This amendment is for the regulation of fees. It's just to close a loophole that we have seen in other jurisdictions uh, commonly to learn from some of our neighbors and from some other folks across the country um, where we have seen that when rent regulations, whatever they may be, uh, go into play, um, that landlords then uh, replacing rent with new and increased fees to uh, basically shift the rent gouging into fee gouging. So this is to allow us to regulate that, to ensure that that uh, doesn't happen. Um, there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, I have in here to basically cap the fee increases the same way that we're gonna cap the rent increases. Um, but if folks have other ideas on that, uh, happy to listen to those ideas as well. Just wanna make sure that we don't fall into the same trap uh, that we have seen from our neighbors. Um, and Mr. Bruton, if you would be able to speak to this amendment, that would be helpful. Um, what would be the consequences of passing rent regulation without also regulating fees? Um, so I can't predict what individual landlords would do, but what this, uh, we, as, amended the current bill does not regulate fees and so one a landlord could say theoretically charge you two thousand dollars for rent and a thousand dollars for fees just saying I mean that's that's kind of an extreme or hyperbolic example but it's not regulated and so it would not there would not be a, pro, a prohibition on that and so uh, whether it be uh, this amendment as exactly worded or something else or like a nub of something, uh, DHCA does uh, advise that it would be helpful to have in the law the ability for DHCA to regulate fees to make sure those types of workarounds don't happen. And then obviously you all would get to take a look at that through method two regulations. So with that, um, I'll make a motion to regulate the fees. Uh, motion moved by Councilmember Brink, seconded by Councilmember Jawando. Uh, Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. Oh. I was confused by the flashing green. Yeah. It's a new system. Um, so um, thank you, Councilmember Mink, for, for the, this amendment. Um, my concern is that 
um, some of the some of the fees um, uh, may be utilities, may be HOA is in addition to the to the lease, and um, a lot of these uh, fees go up the, the, more than inflation and more than six percent. And we just had the discussion about uh, the capacity, staffing capacity for um, for for the for the office. Um, so I'm concerned about um, the exceptions. For instance, if it is, um, if the fee is legitimately, it goes up more than was what is regulated. It comes to you for approval, um, or or the rate, then you would have to approve all these um, these fees and whether you have the capacity of that. The the other issue is the new fees that come up. I really uh, understand the issue of bad actors coming along and trying to uh, increase fees or make up fees that that weren't there prior to rent control. But there are legitimate new fees that come up. I'm thinking of maybe EV access. We've had many discussions about how multifamily uh, apartments, multifamily units are going to handle EV access, uh, new gym access, um, extra parking fees. So things come up in the normal course of doing business all the time. And those, and those new fees aren't a gouging or a way to get around rent control. There's just a normal, it's just the normal uh, cost of doing business. And so how would you propose that your office is going to handle all these requests for new fees? Thank you. Excellent question. Um, obviously, our motivation is needs to be in um, in enforcing a law or regulation um, would be to uh, balance the needs of the landlord to pay for what they're offering, uh, the the needs of the tenant, but also our staffing needs, as you say. Um, and a law doesn't work if we don't enforce it or if we don't have the capacity to enforce it. Um, Based on my experience in the district, they have uh, something called a services and facilities petition, which they use to regulate fees in certain ways. Um, and that deals more with, say, for example, utilities were included in your rent, but then the landlord goes from a, a single meter on the building to, me to, to metering every single unit, and they want to transfer that cost to the tenant. Then you're, if effectively taking away something you were paid in your rent and you would be charged separately through the utility company. And so they've dealt with it as if something is taken away, you should receive a reduction in rent. If something is given, then the landlord should be able to petition to add something in rent. And I will also add there are kind of two different types of fees. Those are, those are fees that are voluntary. So say, for example, you added a charging station where you could use your credit card or something to pay for that, and that would be a voluntary thing. Or if you added a gym where you had a key fob access and you only had key fob access if you paid, that's different than, say, if you added a gym and you charged everyone and across the board amenity fee no matter what. Um, and so I agree with you with the complexity. Um, we would try to formulate regulations that would be minimally invasive um, and to get at, we would want to make, basically we would want to give guidance to the landlord that you should be providing something of value in exchange for the fee, not just say an amenity fee for the general benefit of living in the unit, um, something like that. And so I tend to look at this one as, and we would have to come back to you with regulations, um, to be minimally restrictive, but to make sure that there weren't the abuses like the hyperbolic example that I gave earlier. So so my view on this is I think that this is a really complex issue, and I think that um, from the uh, landlord perspective, um, this is one of those uh, very detailed issues. I, I can't support this without seeing the regulation before that. So thank you. Councilmember Sales. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Mr. Burton, um, I know that you're new to this position, but um, you know, during COVID, the county saw many landlords get creative and add additional fees to get around the temporary rent cap. And I was wondering if you can tell me anything about um, the volume of fees 
fee complaints that were received during the COVID uh, rent control period um, and how those um, complaints were handled by the department. I don't know if there's any record of how that was handled and how I know you've shared how you hope to continue should uh, this uh, measure pass, but just wanted to see what our history has been in this space. So thank you. Um, as you mentioned, I'm new. Um, would you would it be okay to ask Nicole Catravanos, the, uh, the manager of our Office yes, of Landlord absolutely. and Tenant Affairs, to answer the question? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. If you could um, just introduce yourself for the record. Nicole Catravanos, Office of Landlord and Tenant Affairs Manager, DHCA. Similar to Director Bruton, I have been at DHCA for just a little bit over a year, and I don't have exact data regarding the complaints that we've received um, with respect to fees and fee increases. Mm -hmm. However, within the past year, um, I, speaking with the previous manager and with the investigators, the majority of which have been within the department for at least over five years, there has been an increase in complaints with respect to fees. Mm -hmm. um, whether the fees have been increased or there's new fees um, being incorporated to leases. But I can't give any specific numbers. We could go through the data um, and then provide concrete information afterwards. Yeah, I think if um, this does pass and um, Mr. Burton does come back for s the specific language and uh, process, it would be helpful to have that information um, because, you know, we need to ensure are we passing this to, um, a ref you know, to cap any increases at the same cap as the rent cap should it pass. So. I look forward to those discussions should this move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Mr. McCartney Green, or I just want to make sure I understand and everyone understands uh, the, the millions watching at home what this would do. It would cap uh, the increase at 3% or 6%. Just ex explain what those 3 and 6 are related to. Are they the base rent amount? Yeah, let's take Similar it back to, there. And so mm -hmm. right now in the bill, there's a base rent. And so the base rent includes the fixed monthly charge that a tenant would really charge every month. In addition to that, landlords can also charge other fees, whether it's utility, management, parking fees. What this is regulating is generally any fees above the base rent um, would be capped at the CPI plus 3%. Or six percent of the original fee. Oh. Give it easy. Give <laughs> it easy. <laughs> right. So if the fee was a hundred dollars, and a CPI plus three percent, let's say that, that amounted to four percent, right? That would have you at a rate of forty. Four, four dollars, right? Four dollars, right? Okay. If it's a monthly thing. If it's monthly, yeah. Right, so you would only be able to increase that by a hundred and four dollars. Is, is everyone on page? By four. By four, four sorry, by four dollars. Year to year. Yeah. Year to year. I year to year. That. Right. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, which would be four times twelve, whatever that is, right? Right. 20, Forty-eight. 48. So fifty dollars. We can help you. Roughly fifty dollars. Roughly fifty dollars. Just want to give people context yes. of what we're talking about. So. Not in, so so fifty dollars a year or so I, I think the I seconded this because I agree it's the right principle. What I don't know is if what's the right number, mm -hmm. and okay. so you know I would be comfortable if we just gave you authority to to regulate fees as a general matter, and didn't specify. I know this is not the amendment before us, but I'm just saying what I'm would be comfortable. Didn't specify what the number was, and we could deal with that. In regulation, once you did some research, talked to people, looked at it, we know this is an issue. You know, they did, in last year in Florida, you know, the, this, the governor there passed an unlimited fees bill that you can charge any fee, um, and so there is a effort to kind of get around this. So we certainly want to wouldn't want to leave a gaping loophole, and there should be regulation. There are reasons why fees need to go up, so I would just that would maybe be a friendly amendment to say we just give a DHC authority through method two to regulate fees and you would come back to us with what that regime would look like. I second. Well, are you offering to make I am that offering amendment? that, yeah. 
And I, I would support that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that the, in, the principle is the important thing. We want to make sure there's the ability to regulate fees. We also want to do it in a way that is sensible. I completely agree with the, with the points raised that we want to make sure that the appropriate flexibility is there. We just need to make sure that, you know, we're not, uh, you know, unintentionally leaving the same loophole that Florida is right now creating. Uh, so I, I think that makes sense if that, uh, but what are your thoughts, Mr. Bruton? Oh, I, yes, I agree. Um, so I had jotted down something, and, uh, uh, and Ms. McCartney Green can, can uh, add something to it. She made a, a, a good point. Uh, something very simple like the director must adopt method two regulations necessary to regulate fees on regulated rental units. Sorry about the repetition, of course. So moved. Well, I, 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 wants to I, add I would like to clarify so, that. Go ahead, Ms. I'd like McCartney to clarify not only to regulate the fees, but to set um, what the rate or the cap is. And so they're doing both things, setting it and regulating what those fees will be. And, and that, that was the intention? Yes, through method and two. You still Just to clarify, that. setting the rate could doesn't specify how low or high it would be. And also, I just wanted to add one thing I forgot to say to Councilmember Balcom's question. Um, I want to assure you that I don't want to take on the responsibility of having landlords have to go through the department for every single new fee they do. I want to give guidance and regulation about what is within the parameters the uh, that, that works. And then if things are outside those parameters, then you have to apply. So yeah, I, I want to be as little burdensome as I can. Okay, so that uh, friendly amendment has been adopted uh, or uh, accepted. Council Member Fani Gonzalez. My questions have been answered, thank you. Very good, Council Member Alvanaz. Thanks. So can we go back to utilities? Are they included or are they not included in fees? Or does it depend on the nature of the It, it depends on the lease. landlord. Um, usually, I can't say, I can't speak to every landlord, but usually utilities are in either included in your rent because they are master metered and they just divide it up among all the units, uh, or if your unit is individually metered, then you are being charged by the utility itself um, and the landlord is not in the chain. Okay, because we just passed a month ago 7% increase in WSSC fees, so obviously higher than 6%. So um, how would that work? <laughs> would, would, would a landlord, would all of them have to seek approval? Or so what I in those two different scenarios I mentioned, if uh, if it's a multimetered building, then the landlord would not be bothered at all. The fee, the, you know, like your your per kilowatt hour fee for what you're using would be charged directly to your individual utility bill. If it was master metered and the landlord had to absorb that cost, then I would advise the landlord to file a fair return petition to say that you know like. Um, uh, you know, my bottom line, my net operating income has been impacted by uh, this increase in utility fees, and therefore I'm filing this, you know, uh, to make, you know, to make the adjustment. And just a general, just personnel question, coming from D.C., I know their office is rather large, but approximately how many people are responsible for working through exemption requests that landlords may have in the District of Columbia's housing department? And then how many do we have in Montgomery County currently? Um, so, well, we don't, since we don't have the, I'm sorry if I'm mis mistaking your question, we don't have the law yet in Montgomery County. Understood, so but, but just, you know, there's a transition period yeah. here and, and we're adding another layer, even if there are guidelines, if they fall outside of the guidelines, there is still a process by which property owners will need to come to you and I'm trying to be able to understand capacity. Um, let's see. So for DC, I'm taking this from the fiscal impact statement we provided to, to OMB. Uh, DC has 11 FTEs in the office that uh, deals with rent stabilization, and they're broken up by one manager, two rental program specialists. Uh, those are actually their lawyers, um, strange name for it. Uh, two program specialists, one housing provider, ombudsman, and six contact representatives. Um, and so the contact representatives, they deal with the intake, and then the way DC deals with administering certain petitions is that they have an outside accounting firm that will run the numbers. Uh, the contract specialist 
handle checking for accuracy and did you follow the rules and does it have all the required information and then the outside accounting firm uh, checks to make sure the numbers are correct. Um, I can go into more detail but I won't you know, like bother you with that. Um, and we are recommending, um, let's see, we are recommending four pro, so our recommendation for would be um, we have one manager, uh, one senior senior IT specialist to deal with the obvious things, uh, one investigator uh, to get at issues of noncompliance, uh, one program manager, one admin specialist, and four program specialists. And so the four program specialists among their duties uh, would be to deal with uh, the incoming applications and then we would contemplate depending on the volume as to whether those four program specialists are adequate or if we need to bring on a contractor for uh, specific math checking or things like that. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think the, I appreciate the questions from colleagues at the beginning of this particular amendment um, and there really isn't very much evidence necessarily to support the need for it other than again anecdotal information and you know concerns that have been raised by some but no real um, systemic information that would that, that gives me pause um, in, in terms of you know what what are we actually trying to solve here, and I'm a little uncomfortable with the ambiguity too uh, of what we might be able to pass. I, I get the intent, um, but I just don't think that's good policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to jump in and uh, share two experiences that I've personally had over the last year in talking with tenants in two different parts of the county. Uh, one, uh, during the pandemic when we had our uh, limits in place, uh, when we froze uh, any rents, uh, was talking with uh, some residents in East County who said that while their rent was not allowed to increase, their parking fees increased a lot. It happened. Um, but more disturbing, was earlier this year in February I was talking with residents in Gaithersburg on Clapper Road and the residents, um, two well-educated people younger than me, uh, had a one-bedroom apartment. They weren't complaining about the rent. The rent was fine. What they complained about was for that one, their one-bedroom rental apartment they were paying nearly $500 a month in electricity bills. That's more than my single family home for electricity. Uh, they did not have servers. They did not have any fancy electrical equipment. Um, it was sub-metered and that was the deal that whomever owns that property engaged in with whomever operates that meter to charge them nearly $500 a month for a one bedroom apartment. It's unconscionable. Uh, I've already looked into it to see what we can do here and the county does not have any authority over this. This is state law. Um, and so there's a real problem here. Uh, and so I, I know that there are other circumstances, other avenues in which uh, landlords are trying to uh, increase fees um, and it is real. Um, you know, I appreciate Councilmember Albernaz noting that we as a body, the council unanimously supported a 7% increase in WSSC fees for water uh, and so we have to have some ownership over that as well and uh, I am comfortable with DHCA creating a fee schedule as I understand it to be. That's a fee schedule. Yeah. Um, that's what I would prefer. Um, some guidelines um, to, to see uh, f some guidelines for uh, property owners to, to help uh, recognizing that there are increases outside all of our controls that they need to manage. Um, but there's got to be something done about a couple living in a one bedroom paying $500 for a submetered electric bill. Unconscionable. I've already begun conversations with members of the state delegation to see what we can do in that regard, um, but it is proof positive 
that fees are being used, that utilities are being used in other ways, um, then we got to stop that as we can. Um, but I am comfortable with this amended uh, amendment to, to set up a fee schedule by DHCA. Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just two points of clarification. I just want to make sure I understand the amended motion. Um, there was two aspects of the initial motion. One was about setting the rate. The other one was about new fees and prohibiting new fees unless you get approval. Any new fee had to be approved by the department, which does seem to be an administrative question, and I think that is part of what I heard from uh, Councilmember Balcom, uh, among others, uh, Councilmember Albert as well. Uh, so I just wanted to confirm that. Is this is the idea that this amendment would only deal with the rate setting and not the prohibition against new fees, or was it only changing the first part? So that's clarification number one. I, oh. Well, I, I'm going to ask the motion <laughs> okay. first because this body moves amendments, and then we can get clarification from the department after that. But My intent was just yeah. to amend A1 which was related to the fee schedule. I didn't, so the B part would remain in my view. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I would be fine with just sending the whole package to regs and just saying, you know, I want to make sure that we give DHCA full flexibility to, uh, you know, to put together something that makes sense and to do the requisite research and, and you know, and what have you. Uh, and I just want to make sure that, um, you have the ability to include in that both existing fees and uh, and new fees, it, it, taking into account that yes, I think that uh, Mr. Bruton agrees that he doesn't want to have to be looking at every single new fee, and so writing those regs in a way that, as you were mentioning, would have uh, you know have a set of guidelines that would prevent you from having to look at every. Would you be able to speak to this? You see where I'm going with this? Sure. Yes. Um, so I would DHCA would prefer. No, no offense to anyone, but would prefer that the amended, the, uh, the amendment as discussed would replace the entire amendment um, because it would be regulatorily burdensome on the, on the department, but also on landlords to have to check with us for every single fee. I think providing guidelines on what are, you know, like kind of like within the boundaries fees, like uh, Council President Glass was indicating. Um, and then having it more for um, if you're asking for something outside of what is normal, then you have to apply. Or if you're asking for something outside of whatever you all determine in collaboration with us are reasonable limits on the increase of fees. So okay, so I'll go back to the motion makers just for the clarification. I'm after good with that. Department. Yeah, so just saying basically that DHCA will regulate uh, fee increases and new and new fees, something that something that gives broad authority, and then we're going to expect as we work on uh, regs uh, to see something that is going to limit the necessary capacity on the DHCA side for. Okay, and as the director so. and uh, council attorney are negotiating the language, as it was written, it's a little bit unclear to me because it talks about a landlord of a regulated unit cannot increase a fee charged. To a tenant, but doesn't say the fee charged by the landlord right. to the tenant. And right. WSSC, I mean, if this speaks to the nuance of these issues and some of the concerns that I have, the master, uh, you know, dynamic as you talked about, where there's one energy bill, one water bill. You know, if it's a single meter for an entire building, particularly the older building stock, that's much more common as opposed to individualized meters. In an individualized meter, the landlord generally doesn't charge anything. They have the utility company directly uh, charge, and so, you know, it would be unreasonable to insert the landlord into that dynamic. So uh, could I just get a clarification on that? Because I think as it was ori originally written, it speaks to fees charged to a tenant. Well, the tenant could pay cable fees. They could pay, you know, water fees. They could pay energy fees, et cetera, gas fees. Yeah, absolutely. That ambiguity is problematic. And, and with, I think, as understood now, we would be replacing the entire text of the original of Councilmember Mink's originally proposed amendment, and 
Blue Dean, uh, sorry, <laughs> Mr. Cartney Green, um, can, you know, will polish up the language, but effectively what we have is the director must adopt method two regulations necessary to regulate fees, so existing or, or new, um, on regulated rental units, so just ones affected by this bill, not, you know, ones that aren't, you know, like whatever exemptions you have, uh, and set limits on fee increases. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. I think that cleaned it up a little bit, and uh, I will yield back to the President. Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. Uh, so, can you just state the amendment? So, I'll let Ms. McCartney Green can uh, she can read what I have, and then make any more prudent uh, language amendments. I want to be clear so we have everyone that's following because we had a lot of back and forth. Yes. And so, bottom of page six, top of page seven. Councilmember Mink had an amendment to regulation of fees. The proposal here now is to replace that amendment or amend that amendment with the language that says the director must not a, must adopt method two regulations necessary to regulate fees on regulated rental units and set limits on fee increases. Um, so can you say it again? I'm sorry. Sure, that's fine. We're replacing the language with the director must adopt method two regulations necessary to regulate fees on regulated units or units within the scope of this bill and set limits on the fee increase. My understanding that limits is also in tandem of uh, Council uh, President um, Glass who also mentioned a fee schedule as well. So that may. Would they be synonymous? Interchangeable. I I defer to the lawyers. <laughs> I um so I guess my again the complexity is in what is in the regulation. So so this doesn't necessarily state that uh, if it is over the limit, whether there's any remedy that you ca that, that you the director can then approve something that is over the stated limit and so that's just unclear in the amendment and I so I still go back to the complexity of without seeing a regulation I I, I can't uh, I can't say one way or the other on, on where I stand on the bill and then for clarity this just provides a framework it doesn't provide the details that you're looking yeah for. we've got a chicken and egg situation I can't write regulations until <laughs> And, and just to clarify uh, or state for the record, a method two regulation, once the executive develops it, it does come back to the council for review. That's correct. Uh, council Member Stewart. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to echo um, what the council uh, president said regarding fees. I think one of the places that we probably receive a, some of the most questions from tenants is regarding fees and lack of clarity around what actually can be um, requested of them and how it can be increased. And I just want to thank the Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs for all your amazing work. Um, and the handbook that you do have uh, for tenants right now is just so vital for them understanding what can and cannot um, happen. And I think adding this language to this bill and moving forward with these regula regulations is important not just as we're talking in the context of rent stabilization but just overall will be usually helpful for people who rent in our community so I just want to say I will be supporting uh, this amendment. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much Mr. President. Um, I too am going to support the, the uh, amendment but I, I'd like some clarification. If WSSC goes up seven percent, which we've approved, which we agreed with, do you automatically have to, as part of your regulations, go back and say whatever WSSC is charging, you can go up seven percent, or does each individual uh, landlord, each individual property owner, have to come to you? Uh, no, they wouldn't have to come to us. So. Uh, I'll go back to my two examples of the different types. Um, if it's a master metered building, then the landlord is going to have to absorb yeah. those. And if um, 
they are not able to absorb those and keep their net operating income at an adequate level, then they could file a fair return petition to get an increase on all the on all the rents. Um, or, you know, they they do have uh, the CPI plus three, and so many landlords. Uh, if you look as the you know like the statistics everybody's mentioned already, that over the past. 30, 40 years, it's been an average of 3%. Over the past 10 years, it's been an average of 2%. CPI plus 3 would pretty much almost always um, allow the landlord more than has been the traditional average. And so there is some, because CPI is set by uh, changes in your local economy, uh, which includes utility prices and things like that. And so there may be a slight lag time uh, between an increase and the CPI calculation annual, I mean, the, the one we use annually. Um, and so that will help the landlord to, um, to uh, make up the difference in something that is going to be spread, you know, beyond just them, the utility increase. But if they are not able to do that, then they can go to a fair return. Uh, on the cases where tenants are paying their own utilities, if they're individually metered, uh, then the tenant would just have to deal with that on their own. The landlord wouldn't be affected. To the egregious <clears throat> example mentioned by Council President Class, um, I would need to know more about what kind of strange contractual arrangement was done by with the, between the landlord and the third party to understand that, to be able to speak to that specific example. And, and on that one, um, I thank you for your explanation, but on that one, because that person would be in the city of Gaithersburg, it wouldn't be part of this legislation anyway for the sub-metered. And if it's sub-metered, doesn't that mean that that person is paying the, the, um, the amount of electricity or whatever it is that they're actually using? If, if the meter is from Pepco, is that correct? Yes. They sh you know, sometimes meters are wrong, but it, you know, like theoretically, that's the way it's supposed to work. That you're, pay, if you're individually metered, you're paying just for the energy or water, you know, source that you're using. So it really does need to be investigated in several ways, including our our friends from the state. And then, what happens if right now someone is renting uh, an apartment and cable it was mentioned about cable, cables included, and then the landlord because we're doing all of this, says, you know what, I'm not going to include cable. It, the, if you want cable, you can go to, you know, to, to the individual cable provider. What happens in that case? Um, do you mean currently or? or? Under this legislation. Oh, under this legislation, that would fall under whatever regulations we're going to promulgate. Um, and in consultation with uh, industry members with landlords, uh, as well as tenant advocates, uh, we will need to devise an equitable solution where a landlord is charging for something as part of base rent. It's you know it's just included in your rent, not itemized out or anything. Right. If they're charging for something, uh, and then they discontinue it, and we'll make it something that every. Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, say your land, your proper your your building has a uh, laundry room. Uh, and I experience this many times in DC. Your, your building has a laundry room, you pay for that service as part of your rent, landlord decides for whatever reasons to discontinue use of the laundry room. What happens then? You're, you know, you're paying the same amount but not getting the same. And so that's something that we'll have to try to deal with equitably in, uh, in talking with stakeholders and developing the regulations. Okay. I do want to know, Council Member Katz, if there are some fees that are actually regulated by state law. So we, we don't want to get to, and mentioned cable, I'm not going to go too far into that, but um, certain fees are germane to just a property, parking, bike, biking fees, but um, do the regulations make sure that if it's regulated by the state, it's not something obviously the county would be able to, to adopt in its regulations? Well, but in my point, my concern was that whether whoever's regulating with cable is charged, and, um, it was whether or not it was already a part of when I rented my apartment and, and versus that the landlord says, look, I'm just not going to provide it anymore, I, you know, for a variety of reasons. So uh, you, you've answered it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. 
back to the state preemption issue, um, do we need to include language in the amendment that sort of explicitly states that there are state preemption issues or not? I don't think it's a, I think if it's clearly laid out in, in the state law, then we are directly um, preempted, so that's not necessary for us to list in our regulations. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that, you know, we could choose to identify those in the regulations just as a guide, because many landlords use these use regulations as a guide, and so we could specifically note uh, uh, state issues uh, that they, you know, that, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, that that that, that um, uh, supersede um, any county regulations. I want to note that the, the lease is the contract between the tenant and the landlord, and the lease is usually what dictates the fee upon signing. And so that's the basis to look from. Then obviously, as a guide, if there are additional fees that are outside of the lease, then those are things to also look at. Right. And I, w I want to make the, the go back to the distinction between a comprehensive fee that everyone's required to pay and a voluntary fee, such as the electric charging station or a gym membership um, or something like that. And um, we would, uh, I don't think, I mean, uh, you know, somebody may tell me, I, you know, like to give me an example where I would have to rethink, but I don't think we want to uh, regulate voluntary fees. Um, you know, uh, we don't want to tell somebody how much they can charge for the kilowatt hour for charging your car or something like that, as long as it's not something required that's, to, you know, that's required to live there. Does that need to be in the regulations that come over, or should we include that language in the initial amendment that we're discussing right now? Um, since I don't think I'm omniscient, I wouldn't necessarily uh, say put it in the, in the law, but I think we should look at putting it in the regulations if we don't find any contrary examples uh, to what I just said. I think council staff would appreciate the opportunity to, to, to take a look at it before putting it either in the bill or, or regulations. Whether or not it should be voluntary or the type of fees that we're, we're looking take, at. Take a look at whether we should include it right now or? No, no, no. Okay. Whether or not mention the regulations. So my recommendation would not be to include it here. I mean, we've set the framework here for regulations, but the question is whether or not to the regulations take into effect uh, voluntary fees or mandatory discretionary fees, I'd like the opportunity to take a look at that to see what that would look like before um, agreeing to that here today. Okay. I'm not a, we could repeat one, maybe not last time, but one more time, um, what, what the amendment is at this point? Um, the director must adopt method two regulations necessary to regulate fees on regulated units and set limits on uh, fee increases. So I, I could break that down, uh, and sorry for the overuse of the word regulation, um, to, so we'll be regulating fees. Regulated units would be only rent stabilized units. If, if you have an exemption from rent stabilization because of, say, a rolling new construction exemption or anything else, this would not apply to you. Um, it's just for regulated, and uh, so we will set up regulations on that, and then we also will have the ability to set limits on fee increases. Okay. Um, so, um, and, you know, I don't know how long it will take for you to develop the regulations and come back to us. I know it's probably a matter of months and probably not until the fall because we, we only have one more session before the end of this term is up, but um, what do we tell property owners in the meantime? How would you communicate to them? Because we're slated for work session and action today. We're going to be voting on this today. Um, and so how would you advise them on the issue of fees based on this amendment between now and when the regulations, which still have to be reviewed by this body, and that may take more than one session, um, how would you, what would you, what would your message to them be? I defer to Ms. McCartney-Green regard because that deals with the timeline for, for implementation, and so. Yeah, so there's a couple of things happening here. One, this bill will set a cap on the base rent. But when it comes to regulation of fees, that will be further delineated in, in regulations. There may be a cap. There may be a fee schedule. My understanding in terms of the type of fees that would be regulated. And so that is not, my understanding is not being determined today. It's setting a framework. Um, and so for landlords that are listening, there are those that do have a base rent and through utilities, um, whether it's, it's mandatory or whether it's discretionary, 
um, those fees the department would look at. Now there is an opportunity for the department to approve those fees if they are deemed uh, necessary or in you know looking at a fair return. And so um, that that my understanding of the proposal here today is is having some type of regulation on fees that are over and beyond. But this doesn't impact fees for now until we receive the regulations. Correct. Okay. Councilmember Mink. Just wanted to appreciate the discussion and note that I think that um, uh, you know th I I'm really just looking to do something that's reasonable here and to prevent something ridiculous from happening. Um, so I, I and I and I think that we're actually all aligned in that goal. Um, so I trust us to be able to to come to a, a consensus when um, DHCA comes back with sensible regulations that are based on research uh, and capacity. Um, I'm not out here trying to pull one over on anybody, and I don't think anybody else is either. So, um, yeah, I, I look forward to having something reasonable in place. Thanks. Thank you. Vice President Friedson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I just, a point of clarification. The transition clause that we agreed to already is the requirements of this act must not apply and must not be enforced until the method to regulations required under the act take effect. That means everything. So I just, I, I want to be clear because I think there has been some misunderstanding about how that works. Nothing that is approved here based on what is before us right now, now there could be amendments to change that later in this conversation, but nothing is in effect until the regulations are in effect. And that includes fee regulations because the this transition language is very clear. So I just, because that's, that's different than what was just said. So I just want to make sure in response to Councilmember Albernaz's question. I just, so we're all in agreement there. That's correct. Okay, because there was a differentiation between the fee dynamics in the response to Councilmember Albernaz's question and the rent provisions, the base rent provisions. And under the transition clause, there is no difference. Anything that is kicked to regulation Nothing in the nothing in the act would take effect until the method two regulations, all of them, that are required under the act, are approved by the council. That's correct. Okay, I just I, 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 that was not clear. I just wanted to make that very clear. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Could I just make one little comment? Uh, to, uh, we uh, no, I'll just uh, no, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Councilmember Jawanda. And just very briefly, that is correct. And, and also, under current law, you can't increase rent to talk without 90 days' notice. So, and only once a year. Yeah, and only once a year. And so, the idea of the lining up of what we're going to do later with when the regulations are going to be done, the intent is to have all that line up. So, yes and yes. All right. Very good. Um, so we have a, a motion before us, an amended motion uh, limiting uh, the increases of fees through Method 2 regulation. All those in favor of the motion? And that is 8. Uh, all those against? 8 to 3. The motion passes. Okay. Next is an amendment I would like to put forward, um, and that is an amendment regarding um, banking. Um, the, the bill, as proposed, limits rent increases to uh, CPI plus 3%, um, but it is my fundamental belief that most landlords or good landlords are going to do what they have to do to keep their tenant and are going to limit uh, rent increases to whatever uh, the costs uh, might be for that particular year. Uh, and so there are going to be probably many, many more instances where a landlord does not increase rent um, to the maximum of CPI plus three uh, as currently allowed in the law. Uh, but over the course of a tenancy, uh, things might happen uh, and there might be a need to increase the rent uh, because of unforeseen circumstances, because of other changes that might have happened, 
And for the landlord who has been what I would call a good landlord by limiting rent to as low as possible, uh, I think they should be able to bank that dif differential and to be able to use it if necessary at a later point in time. Um, and so this amendment uh, would allow that. Uh, and uh, I think it is an incentive for landlords to be good landlords uh, and allow them the flexibility uh, if they need to increase rent uh, at a future point, recognizing that they had, uh, for a very long period of time, limited rent for the, uh, for the tenant's benefit. So I would like to move this forward. Is there a second? Second. Uh, seconded by Councilmember Ludke. Um, Councilmember Ludke. Just a quick question. Um, I support, obviously, I just seconded your motion, but there appears to be an extra word in here. So the definition of banked amount says means the dollar amount of an annual bank rent increase, and I think bank shouldn't be there. It just should be the dollar amount of an annual rent increase allowance that a landlord did not use to increase the rent for a regulated unit. Is that correct? Councilmember Luki jumped ahead. Yes, this is a right. <laughs> amendment to All right. uh, remove the word after annual, the word bank should be striked from that. Okay. Right that was it. Yes. Thank except, you. Except that change. Uh, thank you. Council Member Stewart. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, Council President for moving this forward. As if people read ahead in the packet, they know I have also a banking provision. But um, I'm going to offer an amendment to uh, the Council President's um, amendment so maybe we can get rid of mine <laughs> um, and move through this a bit quicker. Um, so the amendment I would like to put forward uh, has two parts. Um, in the first line, uh, to add new leases. So it would say, except as a provider under subsection B upon a lease renewal or new lease. Um, and then also to add um, under a, a cap of 10%. Um, because at the moment there is uh, no cap on this, and as we were talking about before, uh, you know, making sure that residents had um, predictability and knew what the possibility of their increases would be each year. And so, basically, on the first part of suggesting adding new leases, what will that do? Well, that provides guardrails on how much a landlord can raise the rent when the unit is vacated. And this is key for Montgomery County because we do not have just cause eviction. And we know from the excellent OLO report, which points out that jurisdictions with rent regulations but without added tenant protections may find some landlords will attempt to end a lease with an existing tenant to raise rents. To do so, landlords legally evict ten tenants, raise rents to unaffordable levels for existing tenants to force them out, or fail to renew a lease set to expire without cause. Um, in addition, the impact statements we have on the economic analysis as well as the racial equity and social justice impact statement all recommend that as we move forward with this bill that we include some type of guardrails and, um, and vacancy controls. Um, and I know this is a balance, and we've talked about those balances today, and um, you know, we need to be thinking about how we put these guardrails in place um, and make sure that our good work here um, in creating stable predictability uh, for renters is not undermined um, by some of the specifics here. So I would move forward that we add new leases and um, a cap of 10 years, a 10% um, increase. Uh, I appreciate Councilmember Stewart's uh, amendment. Um, uh, I do not accept it at this time. The reason I don't accept it is because the intention of this amendment uh, is to support tenants who currently have a lease and an agreement with their landlord. Uh, as I understand the proposal, uh, it is to extend that beyond uh, the current leaseholder. Uh, and I think that is a different issue, and I don't want to uh, muddle the, the, the merits of banking on their own. Uh, and I know there is a proposal for vacancy control, and I'd prefer for that to be a separate conversation. Uh, unless, does anyone want to move Council Member Stewart's motion? No? Okay. Wait, wait. I just thought it was an, an offer to amend your motion. And I 
I right. rejected it, so right. unless so somebody wants to second it, it is now, it could then be put on the table for consideration. Okay. I if I, if I accepted the it, motion. then it would be accepted. Right. First. But Pardon me? I thought we just had to deal with the current motion first since you didn't well, accept it. She, she, didn't she, accept she the I didn't accept it, so unless someone wants someone to, second to second it, it and put it on the table, then we can discuss it as an amendment to my amendment. Sure. I'll, I'll second it. Okay. Council Member uh, Katz seconds it. Um, Council Member Katz, you're next in the queue. <laughs> it wasn't for that. No. It wasn't for that purpose. My question is: Is there a different term other than banking? You know, this this term, most people do not consider banking when they're thinking of rents. And and so, is there another way we could? I have no problem saying what we're saying, but saying it in a different different way. And, and, and Scott, I know you've had to think a lot off the top of your head, it, and wordsmithing doesn't have to be right this second, but I do think we should look at something possible. Um, uh, preserve, I'm trying to think of synonyms that, you know, like preserve well, it's, or it's carry Well, it's like an over escrow over. almost, but it's, carry you don't want to do, you know, wh whatever it is. I just think somebody says where they're going to bank it, and it looks like they're taking that money and putting it in a, in a place, and that's not what we're doing here. You're holding that. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Roman Clinton. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I support this. I support this amendment. I think that it's important that we have these pieces, uh, and this this is, a, a, I think, a sensible place to put it. Although where they ultimately end up, I, I'm kind of indifferent on. But this seems like a sensible place to put it. We're here, um, having some kind of uh, having vacancy control is really, really essential for making uh, rent stabilization work in a place that does not have uh, just cause eviction protections, especially. Um, we have seen that it, uh, it, it increases housing stability, uh, which is really essential. It has been found to increase diversity. Um, this was actually one of the, uh, this was the, the top recommendation from the uh, racial equity and social justice uh, impact analysis was to add uh, vacancy control. So that that's really essential. And then having some kind of limit, I think, is also important. Um, and you know, I, this is I think the ten. It sounds like that's our that's a compromise place. It's, I'm sure some would like lower, some would like higher. But we are we're finding a middle ground, and I can certainly uh, respect and support that. Uh, you know, we have all said here that some kind of limit is important. We don't want to be, uh, we don't want to be doing constructive evictions. We don't want to be, uh, we, you know, we need some kind of ground rules here uh, and, and some kind of predictability. And, uh, you know, if once the landlord builds up too many points, then, then we lose that. And so having some kind of guard rules is important. So uh, yeah, I'm going to support this amendment and thank you. Uh, before I turn it over, colleagues, I, I will remind everybody that there is another amendment proposed immediately after this that specifically is about vacancy control. Uh, and uh, as I noted, I did not accept this amendment because I wanted to decouple the two issues. Uh, Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. I think the issue I'm dealing with is not knowing how that's going to go. You know, because I wouldn't be in favor of this amendment personally unless I knew we were going to add vacancy control because the banking idea is one that um, we already included fair return um, and that takes care of one set of things. We uh, Banking as a concept is a good concept. Uh, we, we discussed it in the previous bills. Um, if the, as long as you don't get too high with the rate and you know that's the whole thing here and I think the cap of 10 percent again this would mean, I always like to explain this for folks, if you banked, if you raised at 2% a year for five years, and then you, that, that was a reasonable increase, but inflate, you were allowed to go higher than that, you could accrue those banking and then in the fifth year raise 10%, which is not ideal, right? Again, and not something that we want to encourage. So I think this is at the outer limits. This is really, you know, what was discussed earlier. This would just be protecting folks from the really exorbitant double-digit increases. Um, again, a little higher than I would like, but I think a compromise um, in this context. And so uh, I will support the amendment as well, um, just because it's really critical 
it was pointed, and we have OLO and uh, uh, folks here, how important it is to have this type of protection on the back end while ensuring that we get a fair return for um, our landlords. And again, I think, uh, Director Bruton, do you, I just did want to ask you, um, as you understand this, do you just talk about the uh, banking in this, con in this context? Did I explain it correctly about that example I just gave? Uh, yes. Um, okay. Just, you know, if you'd like me to restate, you know, if a land, uh, like, landlord is allowed s uh, under this bill CPI plus three with a maximum of six uh, on an annual basis, if they choose not to take, say, uh, CP CPI was two uh, in a particular year, two plus three, five, um, and you just, and the landlord decided to only raise the rent three percent, they would be able to bank the dollar amount, not the percentage, but the dollar amount of that different differential and then uh, hold that over uh, under under this under the proposal that I understand from Councilmember Stewart um, uh, and with the amendment from Councilmember Glass or Council President Glass that you could hold that for an indefinite time and you could use it whenever you'd like up to a maximum a, a dollar a total dollar amount not to exceed 10 percent of the existing rent. I don't know if I even yeah. simplified what you said. No, no, you just said it in a different, <laughs> more of a technical way, but I, it sounded the same. So uh, while I appreciate the amendment proposal, I will support this amendment to the amendment, and that will determine whether I support the underlying amendment, but appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, appreciate it. I would prefer that these two issues be taken up separately uh, as well and, and won't be supporting uh, the motion. I did just want to... Uh, note my own personal uh, view on this. Th there was a request early on, even um, in the initial bill at the higher rate for banking or carryover, whatever you want to call it. I was not supportive of that. And I was not supportive of that because the intention of the original bill was to set a point at which it was unreasonable under any normal circumstances for the rent to exceed that number for an existing tenant as part of the stability of that tenant, that family, that individual uh, to uh, have to uh, absorb. Um, when this current proposal was before us, my view has changed because we're at a much lower number and that is a much different approach to this issue. And so I do think allowing for banking where you're not, or carrying over, where you're not incentivizing annual smaller increases in order to prevent the kind of truing up to the market with a new tenancy was a more desirable outcome. Um, I personally think that the vacancy challenge is a very significant issue. And yes, it solves some of the problems that have been cited in rent control that disproportionately help whiter, wealthier, older, better connected people. And the data does show that in strict rent control regimes. One of the ways to address that is by imp implementing some type of uh, uh, vacancy control. The challenge is that also creates another consequence, which is that it actually does have an impact on building housing. And that is in the OLO report as well. So uh, it, it speaks to the nuance and the challenges of this issue. I'll note that I was not for banking. Originally, I would be for a clean banking amendment here, but I will not support uh, the two issues uh, combined, but appreciate uh, colleagues for, for their consideration. I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Councilmember Avalos. Sorry to do this, but can we restate the amendment again? Um, and just because I want to make sure I've got my brain around this. The one presented by Councilmember well, Stewart. Um, I, I was prepared to support the banking provision, and I, I, I we're conflating the two issues, and they're related. <laughs> so, um, But I just need to hear it again. Sure, and um, we're under number four banking provision, and so the proposal by um, Councilmember Stewart is to, one, amend the, uh, not only upon lease renewal, but also including a new lease, uh, a landlord would be able to uh, bank, or we'll consider other language as well, um, the amount of the base rent plus the, the base rent plus the rent that, that's allowed under the um, allowance plus a bank amount. And we went through a scenario where anything over the, the allowed amount, they could bank that percentage. 
What we're also saying here is that there is a cap on the amount of the banking, and that could not exceed 10%. Um, in addition to the cap, there's all, we didn't get to that, but the language is also here on how to use the banking and how that should be um, used throughout the year. Does that, did I, did I miss something there, Councilmember Stewart? No, that's it. Okay. So we're putting new leases. We are also including, um, you're able to have a cap on that banking amount up to 10%. It was one example that was given that if a landlord decided to increase it by a certain amount that's under the allowance that they could bank that throughout, there's a maximum of five years. After five years, you could not continue to bank or use that bank amount. Sorry for lack of terminology. I know you use carryover and reserves. I, I, did, I did not move that. Okay. Yeah, that's not. That's a, a future amendment. That's a future. Yeah. And I was trying to simplify things so we didn't have to deal with it. Second, um, so what what this is is that it would be upon a lease and a new lease. So really thinking about the intent here is if we're if we're going to move forward with rent stabilization and talk about it. As, as we have been talking about it, from, from my perspective, it's important for the individual tenant to make sure what's year to year. But if we're talking about looking at affordability across our community and looking at making sure that because we don't have just cause eviction, people aren't pushed out, banking is important, but so is having some guardrails on what a new lease can be. Mm -hmm. And so trying to think about that in the broadest terms, um, and then also just thinking about as we've had this conversation and was stated in, in opening statements about not making sure, I think all of us agree that rental increases were not moving into those double digits for any person in a given year. And so that's the cap of 10%, even though technically that's double digits, but that seemed to be where the consensus was moving. Okay, that, that's helpful. Um, I. I I'd prefer that the two issues be separate. Um, I, I get and appreciate the intent for simplicity, um, but I'm, I still have questions regarding the vacancy control and I'm concerned that will conflate with the amendment before us. So I won't support your amendment, but that doesn't mean I won't support the amendment. Um, I wanna go back to it. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Sales. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to understand who will monitor how much a unit has banked and used and how will this information be shared and tracked? So, um, in most rent stabilization programs that exist in, in other parts of the country, locally in other parts of the country, uh, reporting is complaint based. Mm -hmm. um, and so, there are two different ways that we can get at this. One, when we set up the, the computerized system to, for landlords to input the rents, we will also have um, a public facing portal so tenants will be able to look up the past and current rents and tenants will be able to see these increases. Uh, and so that will facilitate a complaint based uh, approach to administration. And that I can promise we'll you know to make our best efforts to do what mm -hmm. I can what I can try to do is if uh, since Tebbs is going to be working on this we can try to make it so that uh, we can have algorithms that would recognize uh, what's been banked or, you know like the difference between allowable and what was not taken in the past uh, but that is a more complex thing which I don't know if we can do or not but and so we would probably default to the complaint based structure which is what's used in others and that's up to a tenant to recognize it and to report it to us or, or to to report it to the office of landlord and tenant affairs or to report it to the landlord but the, the landlord's management agent may have made an error um, and they may want to correct it on their own okay and so uh, council member stewart's mm -hmm. amendment is capping the banking at 10%, whereas Council President Glass would not have a cap. Correct. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Mink. 
Um, thank you for the clarifications. Um, and yeah, for, for me, I completely understand for folks who would rather have the issues separate if you're comfortable supporting the banking, but not um, uh, some aspect of, of vacancy control. Um, I, for me, it's really important that we have parity between the protections um, in, uh, in vacancy and in renewal. Uh, that's what makes all of this uh, flow and work well and make sure that we're providing adequate protections. And so uh, for me, it's, it's going to be important that if we're going to do this banking, that we are assured that it's going to come with those applications during both vacancy and renewal. So I would not be comfortable moving forward with this amendment uh, without the amendment that uh, Councilmember Stewart has proposed. Councilmember Ludke. Um, I have a, a quick question on your original amendment. Um, so as I understand it, if uh, this, this applies, if this passes and, and we vote for the, what I call the unamended amendment um, that you have proposed, then each new lease for a unit, it, the banking tolls anew. It starts over because it is a new agreement with a new tenant, correct? That, that was the intention, it, not that this could roll over indefinitely. Right. That was never the intention. Um, right. Yes, yeah, because no, no, so, no, 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 Yes, um, as, sorry, we had to just confer. Um, the uh, Council President Glass's original amendment would you would start over with the with the signing of every new lease with every new lease or new tenant those are different things i could be in a unit and sign a two-year lease and then at the expiration of the two-year lease decide i want another 12 months but i'm the same tenant and there may have been banking then it's a lease renewal and just for clarity lease renewal for council member uh, council member, vice president glass and for council member stewart it's lease renewal plus a uh, New tenant, new lease agreement. I'm sorry. Right. So it's it's it, that right. Let me back up because I think you're misunderstanding my question. What I, what I'm saying is I know that the banked amount could apply if they chose to at each new lease renewal of the same tenant. What I'm getting at is the legislative intent of the council president in making this amendment, or proposing the amendment, would be that when they're when I as the tenant move out after however many leases I have had and lease periods where there's been a banked amount that was available, if the landlord didn't expend that banked amount on me, that tenant, during my tenancy, however long it may have been, when a brand new tenant moves in, the banking starts to toll anew because my prior banked amount that they didn't use on me is not the same as what would occur because it starts fresh with a new tenant. That's not spelled out in here, but that's why I asked the question because I wanted to make sure there was opportunity to provide that clarity because I do think that's critical to this issue. That's correct, uh, Councilor Aluki. And so if you did not use the banking with the current tenant, you would have foregone the opportunity to do that if there's a new tenant that moves in. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And, and so let me just jump in um, here and explain a little further the, the intention and the reason that uh, I, I did not accept the, the amendment. Uh, so by adding new leases to this amendment, um, my, my colleagues have uh, essentially said that it is trying to apply the vacancy control and tie it to this. Um, the other term that has been used is just cause eviction. Um, this body, all of us are in support of just cause eviction. We have told our state delegates and our state senators that we support just cause eviction. People should not be forced out of their home for any willy-nilly reason. The mood of the landlord, if they are good tenants, they should be able to stay in their home. We are unanimous in that. The problem, as I see it here, is that if we apply vacancy control, 
or in this case, new leases to this, uh, this amendment, what is going to happen is landlords are going to raise the rent as high as they can because they will not be able to adjust it later. I'd like to OLO to come up and share with us what they found. And I know it's mixed. It's been alluded to that it's been mixed. Um, this is not this is not the legislative fix for just cause eviction. The only thing that can replicate just cause eviction is just cause eviction approved in Annapolis. The measures that we are talking about can work towards some goal, but there are other unintended consequences. I want there to be just cause eviction. I hope with new leadership in the House of Delegates, with a new committee chair, they might be able to move it, and with a new governor as well. But this amendment and vacancy control in general is not the same. Um, Ms. Rubin, um, can you well, identify yourself, but share with us also the, the information about vacancy control that the OLO report has showed? Sure, Leslie Rubin, Office of Legislative Oversight. Um, in, um, in our research, there is uh, one study that specifically looks at vacancy control and impacts. It's from 2000 out of the state of California. Um, and what the findings showed was that on one side, um, it reduced the rate of rent increases, or let me clarify, in the, um, the jurisdictions in California that had vacancy control compared to looking at jurisdictions that either did not have rent regulations at all or had rent regulations but did not have vacancy control. And they were comparing data on those two um, different groups of jurisdictions. Um, what they found was uh, that there were reduced rates of rent increases in the jurisdictions that had vacancy control. There was decreased renter turnover, so people stayed in their units longer. And uh, there was an increase in ethnic diversity. Um, what they also found is that um, regarding the number of rental units in the jurisdictions, there was a decline in rental units in the vacancy controlled jurisdictions, and there was increase in the number of rental units in non-vacancy controlled jurisdictions. Um, and there was a greater increase also in owner-occupied units created in the vacancy controlled um, areas, so suggesting that um, people were selling their rental units and they became owner occupied or owners moved into their own rental units. Um, the, the researchers here and research in gen researchers in general do caution against extrapolating findings and saying, you know, this research study found this and so that's going to definitely happen over here. That's not possible. But those are the main findings from the one study that looks specifically at vacancy control. It sounds like it's complicated. It's exceptionally it's a, complicated. It's a Rorschach test, if you will, and you can extrapolate what you want. Um, and there is no clear-cut uh, result. Uh, looks like you want to add something else. I So mm -hmm. I did pull out. This is actually quotes from the researchers in that study. Um, the rent control debate is highly politicized, emotional arena with an emotion, enormous amount of hyperbole on both sides. Our findings do not fully support any of the positions and in fact show how complex the rental market can be. Um, so I just want to show that that is the researchers' um, commentary on the own findings of their research. Uh, that, that is a quote for the ages. Um, so. Before I turn it over to colleagues, I, I will again say my deep concern with this is that it will incentivize landlords to increase the rents as high as they can because they will not be able to recoup and reset the rent if a tenant is there for a long time. And the goal here is to encourage long time renting long time stability, have someone in that rental unit for five, 10, 15 years. And when they leave, 
they should be able to reset that rent. And because this will not allow them to do it in a reasonable way, that rent is going to increase year over year to the maximum allowed and according to this bill that is CPI plus three. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by saying that when I drafted my bill, which was joined by five other people, I specifically said I do not want rent banking. I don't want great banking. In fact, and then when we talked about the um, the vacancy control, I actually said in committee, I told the Council uh, Vice President Friedman, let's not have the conversation on vacancy control in committee should happen in full council. And the reality is that I walked into this meeting today saying, honestly, I came, I came in with my mindset, I'm just gonna vote for Council President's um, glasses uh, banking provision as written. Um, but I, I also know that I don't control what my colleagues say or do, you know, I'm just leaving the moment. And um, for what I understand for, uh, from Council Member Stewart, she's withdrawing her vacancy amendment and replace it with this one, uh, which I didn't see coming. But I do think now we truly need to have a conversation on, on vacancy control. I had several questions, um, and I, I heard Council Member Albornoz saying that he also has questions on vacancy. I think you need to spell it out right now, because it's gonna be now. Um, and since she's withdrawing her amendment, um, the issue that really made me pause, and, I, and my question is to uh, Mr. Scott Bruton, is, and Council Member uh, Sales touched on this, is, how can you regulate it? Like, how do you know how much money the other person was paying? Because right now, the only way to know is that when you take the tenant to court, right? Or you take the tenant to the landlord, uh, tenant's um, board um, to create a resolution. So it's, I don't want to pass something that it will be just bureaucratic, it looks nice, but nobody will be able to implement. So I need to understand, you know, what efforts are, is your office gonna be taking, undertaking to ensure that this is actually something that will be enforceable. Um, and at the end of the day, I know each one of us wanna protect tenants and we wanna make sure that we're not um, empowering those bad actors out there, which are a few, but they're out there, uh, who are abusing our communities um, so it's it's so my question again I'm sorry if I went too long but I had to give that background is to based on what just happened now um, walk us through vacancy control how is it gonna be enforced how are you gonna set up your office to make sure that happens and I know already that you're overwhelmed um, and um, I just want to make sure this is not just something that looks nice and we say, yeah, we put it there, but it's it's not enforceable and it's meaningless. So thank you for that. Sure, um, so to be absolutely frank and honest on this, the, the way that we will enforce it, at least initially, is through transparency. And this is and uh, transparency and uh, complaint-based. So this is the way the District of Columbia does it, the, 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 the jurisdiction that I'm most familiar with. Uh, they are creating a rent stabilization database, but for decades they've had um, uh, records at the Department of Housing and Community, sorry, Department of Housing and Community Development in DC, where a tenant can go look up what the past rents have been. And if they see that the past rents deviated from rent stabilization, they can make a, uh, they can file a complaint and then the rents will be rolled back to what it would have been without the violation. Uh, for us, we want to make it easier than that. And so I mentioned before, we're going to create the computerized system to make it easier for landlords to register rents with us. Um, but we'll also be able to do a public facing side of that where tenants will be able to see what the rent history has been on their, uh, been on the unit. And so they will be able to bring to our attention. Um, now, that is, the, the best way we have to do it now. If we can 
working with tabs, figure out a way, figure out uh, you know algorithms or a way for our database to recognize differences that transgress the law. We will we will do our best to implement that, but I can't promise that because. I don't have experience with that. I don't know if the technology exists for us to do that easily. And so the other is to have transparency and open records uh, and allow tenants to uh, notify us if they see a problem. And then we can, uh, then uh, Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs or, um, uh, or depending on how staffing goes, uh, uh, the Rent Stabilization Office uh, can handle those complaints. Uh, Mr. Bruton, I just want to also uh, make a point of clarification, and I'm uh, cognizant of the time here. Uh, you referenced DC uh, yes. and how DC works, and there's just a number of things that uh, we all need to acknowledge in the differences between this bill mm -hmm. uh, and DC law. DC law only applies to uh, units older than 1975, only uh, it excludes homes, it excludes condos, uh, and as it relates to vacancy control, um, they have greater latitude with what they are willing to allow. Um, uh, when it, according to DC law, when a vacant when a tenant vacates a rental unit, the landlord could raise the rent either 10% more than the rent charged to the former tenant if they stayed in the unit for 10 years or less, or 20% or more if the former tenant occupied the unit for 10 years or more. Um, and then DC also allows up to 30%. Uh, if the landlord can identify a comparable unit. Uh, correct, except for that last part. They eliminated the, it used to be 10% or 30% for a comparable unit, and they uh, changed it to just the 10 and 20. So the comparable unit has, has disappeared uh, because it was too, uh, too many loopholes in it. Very good. But again, yes. as we are making our own comps uh, to other jurisdictions, we need to be mindful of what all of that is. Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Um, so, as many people said, you know, the, uh, I think we were all looking at look, looking at these issues separately, banking separately from vacancy control. Um, and um, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez said, you know, mentioned that Councilmember um, Stewart. Uh, <laughs> has withdrawn the vacancy uh, amendment. Actually, she merged the vacancy, <laughs> merged the vacancy. So from Council Member Sales, when she clarified what the amendment stated, it's not just the 10% cap on banking. This is vacancy control with a 10% cap. So I think it's just clear that, that that's what we're talking about. Um, so I... I think that th from my perspective from banking um, is uh, the without banking there will be uh, incentive motivation to hit the cap uh, every year and I think that that is um, a, I think that that will warp what landlords are trying to do and we, we, we've talked this morning a lot about separating good actors and bad actors um, and uh, when we look at uh, landlords who don't have that relationship with their with their tenants the tendency is just going to raise it as much as they can raise it every year but that's not the case that's not what happens for many 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 relationships between landlords and tenants the landlords raise the rate the raise the rate what they need to raise it to um, to continue the business of renting a property. Uh, there will be a, a disincentive to continue that uh, very close relationship between landlord and tenant because the landlord, um, without banking, the landlord uh, will be concerned about what happens next year if, or, or the year after that or the year after that. So I, I uh, support the banking amendment, um, the original banking amendment, um, and I have great concerns about vacancy control. So um, uh, my my druthers would be to vote on these separately. That's not the issue anymore. So I um, I I can't support the amendment as amended. I but I do support the original banking. Thank you, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I wanted to be clear when we're talking about the ten percent for the banking, 
is that is 10 percent overall i believe that is 10 percent overall that's not 10 percent plus the six percent that they could could uh, uh, have have increased is that correct yes that's correct so it's it's 10 percent we we keep using the, the term cap but we also use the term cap for the six percent but this is the overall cap or whatever the right term would be on that of just of the 10 percent yes okay and I I believe and and this you know I, I, I said earlier on that that uh, you know this is a complex problem this is a complex problem uh, at every step of the way but I think we almost need to revisit and I know people don't want to revisit this ever but I think we almost need to revisit this once we do uh, get just cause eviction because I think that would change some of the concerns that we have on items like this mm -hmm. but until we do and unless we do then I, I think this is the the best path forward thanks thank you Mr. President. Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you I appreciate that was one of my questions on my list that this does not mean you can accrue past the tip this would be in substitute of the three percent plus CPI in any given year is that correct and does the current language reflect that do we need to be more clear about that yeah I think I think we're fine with it I mean it's, it's amending adding that provision three any bank amount not to exceed up to 10% I think that, that's in any sufficient. given year I just it, yeah I don't know if we said but okay you're so you're including it in oh, it would be subsection except as provided under subsection B upon a lease renewal or a new lease Correct. this is councilmember Stewart a landlord must not increase the rent of a regulated unit to an amount greater than one the base rent plus two the rent increase allowance under section 2957 which is three percent plus CPI mm -hmm. three any banked amount capped at 10 percent not is, to exceed 10%. not to extend exceed 10 percent so that would be so good so yes. so just yes. making clear so that in any given year which is still a high number <laughs> so i just yes. want to you know again dc dhca considers that constructive eviction i think it's different in this case in that it would assume the only way you could do that is if you had been doing normal increases year to year and you accrued that high of a banking so i think there's built-in protections into just how this is uh, I do also want to say that the 3% plus CPI capped at 6, already um, the idea of why vacancy control will work in this sense will be different, already encapsulates the increases that are happening for the vast majority of landlords across this uh, our county. Um, uh, Director Bruton mentioned over the last 10 years it's been around 2.1%. Over the last 40 years, I think you said, it's more like 3% again both well under and that's including everything so I think this is more than uh, generous in that regard um, and then I just wanted to make a point about the compliance I, I'll never forget knocking this young lady's door in uh, Briggs Cheney and her son and she had moved from a two-bedroom to a one-bedroom in the same apartment complex while we had stabilization the bills that I had introduced and we passed and it couldn't go over two percent because she got an increase of around three and a half percent for her it was about sixty dollars and she could she was working full-time single mom couldn't pay that wanted her son to stay in the same school so negotiated with the landlord to move to a one bedroom when they slept in the same room so she could stay in the same apartment this is she had the protection she didn't know um, and, and obviously she was she knew what was going on because she had the wherewithal like many people don't to negotiate with the landlord to stay in her same apartment so none of this is perfect it's all compliance driven our job will be to get the word out and you and work with media and and, and social and uh, nonprofits and others but none of these protections are as, are good unless you know you have them um, and so I think similarly to the overall cap we're gonna have that challenge the same way we're gonna have the challenge with the vacancy control I was just addressing some questions that were brought now we can try to get around it by posting it having it be transparent on the website the yearly reports the surveys there's a lot of ways to get at that but it's going to be just as much of a challenge because you know you have to know you have the protection so i just wanted to bring that up so i think this is not perfect but it is a, a good amendment i will support it thank you councilmember mink 
Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to note that this is uh, this is not a strict vacancy control amendment. This is a compromise position to to ensure that we are not you know to put some guardrails on uh, uh, you know on what we're going to do during vacancy. But this is you know this is a compromise position, not strict vacancy control. Um, and I'm you know and I'm 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 willing to to support that compromise. Uh, and I think that it's essential that we have vacancy control. Again, we have to have vacancy control attached to this because we cannot be letting these points accrue without some kind of limitation of what uh, of what can happen during those periods of vacancy. Yes, it is hard to make sweeping judgments about different rent, rent regu regulation provisions, um, as we have seen, but there is some consistency in the results that we see. Um, we know that vacancy control helps to keep rents lower. We know that it helps to prevent turnover, that it helps keep people in their homes longer. Those, those uh, data points are consistent across the research that we have currently available that's based on our most current research. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have several really, really good study points. The California study that was mentioned, they compared um, regions with comparable districts and, and comparable not just in like this one has vacancy uh, control and this one doesn't, but they, you know, they picked uh, comparables that have a, uh, you know, border each other. So they're that close to each other. And then where the population had certain similarities so that they could make comparisons that were as meaningful as possible. And that w this was still their finding. Uh, that we are going to help improve housing stability with uh, with vacancy control. Now there were questions about why uh, why we might why vacancy control might be correlated with the loss of some rental units and whether the loss of those rental units in those particular studies um, whether that was a causal link or whether that was uh, linked to other you know pieces of the rent regulations. You know there's still question marks about that. If we have low income tenants who are uh, being assisted by by regulations in place to allow for condo conversions, um, and they, which some of the some of the jurisdictions that were looked at did have some row for protections, right of first refusal protections. Um, I would say that's a positive thing. We want more home. We want home ownership to be accessible to people who are currently renters. So if that is some of our transition from uh, rental units to home ownership, which that uh, with that which that same research paper suggested um, could be the case, uh, I mean that's that's a good that's a good thing. Um, something something else that I think is important that we haven't talked about yet that's related to this issue. Um, vacancy control increases housing stability and that matters for a lot of reasons. It's not just uh, it's not just a moral imperative. Um, per the OLO report that we have on rent regulations, increased housing stability can result in many positive economic, educational, and mental and physical health outcomes. They gave several specific examples in, the, in that report that I think are very compelling. I'll give you just one of them, education. Housing stability leads to higher educational achievements for children, especially vulnerable children. Studies have found that for low-income students, changing homes even one time in elementary school can have a negative impact on school performance, contributing to a long-lasting achievement gap. Poorer children are much more likely to move multiple times compared to more advantaged children. Vacancy control has been shown to enhance housing stability. This is an equity issue in a lot of ways. And I would also note that housing stability has public safety implications, serious public safety implications, not just with you know preventing homelessness and, and that kind of thing, but uh, buildings and neighborhoods in which residents know each other and help each other and keep an eye on each other's kids are safer. So the reasons are many, um, and I hope that we're able to, to vote this through with vacancy control. Councilmember Fonny Gonzalez. Uh, I have another question that I just, I had it under vacancy control amendment. Um, so um, can you tell me, uh, Mr. Britton, how does vacancy control relates to the fair return that is already on, on the bill? I am not opening the discussion on fair return. I just wanna see 
how it relates uh, on this. Let's say, in, I know we keep mentioning apartment buildings, but this bill includes single family homes and it includes condos. So let's use the example of a single family home. Um, and let's say you, you have been banking and then, uh, but you see, and then your tenant leaves, but you see that the home needs to have, you know, so, you know, needs to be repaired. Um, how does fair return will apply here? So if, do you want me to answer that under uh, council member, uh, sorry, under council president Glass's amendment under council yeah, president Yeah, I mean, this Stewart's. is what we're discussing. We, we are entertaining an amendment to the amendment. Yes. Okay. So the amendment to the amendment under this, um, the 10% annual total cap on a rent increase using banking, um, would provide some more uh, pressure relief on uh, uh, drops in, in NOI or it, uh, needs above what the rents have been. And so a, the banking will decrease the number of fair return petitions, but with the cap still, um, and 10% is, is a relatively high cap, um, that you, um, there still will be, if the banking plus the fair return or just using the maximum by itself does not adequately compensate a landlord to keep their net operating income uh, from before, then they would be able to apply for a fair return to increase it above what the annual limit and the banking limit would be. That's exactly where I was when I get to. Thank you. Sure. That was very clear. Okay, uh, final word this, I was going to say morning, this afternoon is going to be Vice President Friedson, uh, and then we are going to recess. We will pick up this amendment after we come back. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Two quick points of clarification uh, before we uh, vote. One is we're going to have to take two votes on this amendment. There's an amendment to the amendment, that is Councilmember Stewart's amendment, which is on vacancy control. That is the first amendment that we will vote on and then we will vote on if that passes the amended version of uh, council president glass's amendment and if it doesn't pass council president glass's original amendment i just we talked about not wanting to conflate there's an option to not conflate you vote no on the first amendment and then vote yes on the underlying amendment if you want them to be together because you don't want to vote on banking or carryover without knowing what the result of this amendment is, then you would want them to be together. I just want to make sure because people talked about that in different ways. I just think it's important that we know what we're voting on. Um, number two, I just wanted to point out, based on the amended version that we are voted on now, uh, Councilmember Stewart's uh, proposal, if a landlord had hit the cap each year of a tenancy, that tenant moves out, a new tenant moves in, the new tenant that new lease would be at three plus CPI, not 10. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that because it would, it, it, it adds in the new lease into the regulatory regime with no banked amount because they wouldn't have carried it over. I just want to make sure that was clear because it wasn't specifically discussed. The 10% number was discussed. And I just want to make sure uh, we're, we're all uh, in, uh, in agreement with that. Uh, with that, I will yield back to you uh, for, for the vote. Um, uh, well, we're not going to vote oh, right now um, because there are other colleagues who've signaled they have questions because of the underlying nature of the amendment to the amendment. Um, and so what we are going to do now is recess. We're going to come back at 115 with a very special proclamation for a very special friend of the council. Um, there are other legislative items that we will be taking up at 130. And then we're, when we are done with those items, we will return to this and be here as long as necessary. We're in recess to 115.